I feel like I'm Jim Webb in Mission Control and we're getting ready to launch the rocket. So I want to make sure everybody gets their seats and we're able to launch uh, this endeavor. My name's Tom Luce, and I certainly want to welcome each and every one of you here this morning to our Texas State of Mind Conference. This is a wonderful day, and I'm really here on behalf of a whole lot of people who have worked for really many, many years to make today possible, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. Mental and behavioral health is an issue that touches virtually every, every Texas family. It impacts a family member, a neighbor, a co-worker. It's touched my family's life. It touches every family's life. It impacts the quality of life wherever we live, in rural Texas, urban Texas, or suburban Texas. Mental health and mental well-being does not respect economic lines, racial lines, ethnic lines, it truly is non-discriminatory. It impacts our economy, our civil society, our safety, and our well-being. And it's time we recognize the impact on all of us. We no longer can have a health care system geared towards the treatment of our physical needs and not our body as well as an integrated part of that. We need a health care system net and a system for all that recognizes we have to deal with medicine to the whole person. That's why we're here today, to publicly launch the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute for Texas. The Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute for Texas is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that will identify and encourage the implementation of mental health policies and practices to enable Texans to get the help they need when and where they need it. Thanks to the generosity of our founding sponsors, the Meadows Foundation, Lada, Hill, Charles Butt, the Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, and the Rainwater Charitable Foundation, we're at this point today. But believe me, there's plenty of time for other people to get on the bandwagon. Thanks to the wonderful people also who have agreed to serve on our board of directors led by our chair, Dr. Martinez, with the Hogg Foundation. And the Hogg Foundation has been one of the leading instruments in also making this happen. And I want to thank the amazing and passionate pe people in cities and towns and counties across Texas who've worked so long to improve lives of Texans and who urged us to start this endeavor and I'm confident that we'll be successful. How can we do that? First, we need to educate our leaders in Austin and in our local communities as to what is working. Mental health looks like, like such an overwhelming issue to deal with that often people get discouraged. And we will identify and highlight the best practices that are helping Texans every day to live a better life so that people will know it's possible and why don't we do this in every part of Texas? We will share the findings with policymakers and communities across Texas with a goal to improve access to integrated healthcare services that work. And to make sure our state policies are restructured to incentivize best practices and remove statutory and regulatory barriers so that every community better serves the needs of every Texan. Ultimately, perhaps the most important issue is to erase the stigma that still exists in our society today that prevents so many people from raising their hand and saying, I or a family member need help. I'm old enough to know that public opinion can change. It changed about breast cancer. I remember when Betty Ford not only said the C word, she said the B word. And it made a difference. And we began to talk about breast cancer and how we were going to deal with breast cancer. The same thing happened with AIDS. And we really, as a society, will not deal with our issues until we're willing to talk about them. 
So we have a big mission, but we're excited to accept the challenge. And we're so blessed today to have uh, some of our wonderful state leaders. You're gonna meet in a minute, Speaker Strauss, Chief Justice Heck, Dr. Janik is here. Uh, and it's important that they're demonstrating their understanding of the importance of this issue by being here today. So I want now, and it's really my distinct honor and privilege really to introduce a shining example of advocacy for Texans who need help. The Meadows Foundation is a result of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute is really been birthed by the Meadows Foundation. And one person in that foundation endeavor has really had the passion and intelligence and leadership and has been backed by a family and board who share her vision. And that's Linda Evans, who's the president and CEO of the Meadows Foundation. So I hope you will join me in a round of applause for Linda Evans for launching this endeavor and bring her to the podium. Thank you, Tom, for leading this very important effort. I do feel like we're birthing a baby today. Chief Justice, Justice Hecht and Speaker Strauss, and it's a, such an honor to have you and so many of our state's leaders, our colleagues, and our friends here with us today as we launch the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute for Texas. With one out of four Americans facing some kind of mental health issue, we are all impacted in some way. It affects our families, our communities, and our economy. Those who suffer from mental illness do not do so by choice. They are too often misunderstood, scorned, bullied, laughed at, called crazy, and sometimes even feared by those who do not understand. The resulting stigma creates shame for them and their families, keeping them from talking openly about the difficulties their illnesses cause, and in many cases, the stigma serves as a barrier to seeking treatment. That is why the Meadows Foundation has made mental health a priority and developed strategic plans that have guided our grant making in this area for over 15 years. These plans were created with the help of many of you all in this room and we are so grateful for that. The creation of a mental health policy institute is the cornerstone of our current plan a two-year statewide research process to assess the need for such an institute revealed overwhelming support to go forward. And as a result, the foundation has committed $10 million over five years to launch and sustain this initiative. We saw the need and we made a commitment to make a difference, but we needed a leader. And there's nobody better qualified to lead this initiative than Tom Luce, a man of integrity and vision talent and experience, and someone with a heart as big as Texas. For the past 30 years, Tom has worked to improve education at all levels. He staffed the initial reform of the Texas public school system and served as Assistant Secretary of the United States Department of Education. He's the founder of several nonprofit organizations, Just for the Kids and the National Math and Science Initiative being two of them. They're all focused on raising the level of educational instruction and attainment for America's children. But Tom understands that children who are disturbed or depressed cannot learn. He is the perfect choice to lead this initiative and we are so privileged to have the opportunity to work with him. All too often, newspaper headlines and 24-hour television news report on tragic events related to mental health problems. Our country wept with the news of Sandy Hook and for the victims of the all too familiar mass shootings at our nation's largest military installation in Colleen. And we hear of abuse or child deaths at the hands of parents because God told them to do so. And in every case, the perpetrator has had a history of mental illness. But we don't have to rely on the media to know this problem exists. We see it in the homeless on our streets in the disruptive child in school, in abusive relationships within our communities and among family members and friends with the problem nobody wants to talk about. 
well, it's time we take up this cause, we wake up to the realities that neglecting this problem causes, and with effective treatment and access to care, those living with mental illness can live safe, satisfying, and productive lives. It is important to make it easier for everyone to know how and when to get to treatment before tragedy occurs. The time is right to focus on mental health, and it's the right thing to do. So join us in bringing mental health out of the darkness and into the light so that those who suffer can and will get effective treatment. Our children, our families, our veterans, and all Texans deserve it. And now I'm honored and very pleased to introduce one of our state's most respected leaders. Representing District 121 in San Antonio for the past 10 years, Joe Strauss has led the Texas House of Speakers since 2009. He has been on the forefront of many issues, but none more important than water. Speaker Strauss built support for the state's water plan, which was overwhelmingly passed by the voters last year. He was also named as one of 10 best legislators by Texas Monthly in 2013. Mr. Speaker, our two families have shared a wonderful friendship for many years. We admire and appreciate the enormous contributions in San Antonio and to the people of Texas that you have made. You and your family have given both your time and your resources to improve the quality of life for others, and it has been our family's privilege to partner with you in many of these efforts. Mr. Speaker, your style, intelligence, and commitment as you guide the House has raised the bar of leadership in Texas. Thank you for your service and for all you're doing to make life better for all of us. But most of all, thank you for recognizing the need for improved mental health policies in Texas and for joining us here today. Your presence raises the issue to prominence and encourages all of us to work together to improve mental health policies in Texas. Thank you. And please join me in welcoming the Honorable Joe Strauss. Thank you all. Good, good morning. Thank you very much, Linda, for the very kind introduction and for the outstanding leadership that you provide as the CEO. And thanks to all of you for being here this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the UT campus where some very important things have been happening recently. Uh, just last week, four American presidents were here uh, for a wonderful event, a remarkable event over at the LBJ Library. And now in a contest that Longhorn Nation is taking just as seriously as those presidents, uh, as those four people competing to be the new quarterback. <laughs> and the launch of this institute today may not draw as many headlines as the presidential visits or this Longhorn quarterback rivalry, but it's a very significant moment that could have an even greater impact on the people of this state, even more impactful than football. And the work that you are, are embarking upon today is fundamentally important because mental health issues have touched so many of us. We know that these issues can be uncomfortable to talk about. Too often, as Linda pointed out, it takes a tragedy such as a shooting uh, at Fort Hood or at Sandy Hook School to bring these issues out into the open. And not too long ago, as Tom mentioned, people have the same, had the same discomfort discuss, discussing breast cancer. But thanks to the tireless work of groups like the Susan Komen Foundation, women now have access to better treatment, education, and support. And so by creating this institute, the Meadows Foundation can bring the same type of awareness to mental health. For more than 60 years, this foundation has done a phenomenal amount of good work for our state. And on issues such as water and public education, you've proven your commitment to the people of Texas time and time again. And now the launch of this institute will allow you to change the lives of Texans in a whole new way. I know the Meadows Foundation will do tremendous work in this field as well. And you won't be working alone. I'm proud to say that last year, uh, the Texas House made funding for mental health services a top priority. We put an additional $263 million toward behavioral health programs across the state. $25 million of that money is being used to match local private donations to expand services. And $5 million is going toward school-based prevention and early intervention programs. 
and the legislature designated $4 million to specifically help veterans, Texans who undoubtedly deserve the best treatment we can provide. These were all important steps, and I'm proud of them, but our work is not done. In January, I gave every House committee issues to work on before next year's legislative session, and several committees will be looking into issues related to behavioral health. For example, the Defense and Veterans Affairs Committee will recommend ways to help veterans as they return from active duty. The chairman of that committee, our friend Jose Menendez, um, I know is coming this morning, I haven't seen him yet, but I know he's very committed to this issue. The Human Services Committee, under the leadership of Richard Raymond, will identify ways to better serve Texans with complex behavioral and medical needs. And the Sunset Commission, a group of legislators and private citizens uh, who review state agencies will be focused on health and human services programs this year. The vice chairman of the, of the Sunset Commission is right here, Representative Four Price, who's leading our House side, along with Chairman Raymond and Representative Cindy Burkett, um, who I know are, are, are here or are coming later today. I know that these members uh, and the Sunset Commission will take a very serious look at how we can better serve Texans with behavioral health needs. In fact, knowing that these important agencies will be coming up for Sunset Review, I recently appointed Tom Luce, uh, our leader this morning, to serve on the commission as well. Uh, Tom is a trusted friend, uh, someone I've turned to many times on many issues, and as today's launch reiterates, he is fully dedicated to the well-being of his fellow Texans. So between the priorities that we have set in our budget, the work of our committees, the task ahead of the Sunset Commission, the Texas House is deeply invested in addressing behavioral health issues. Now I understand that we in the legislature have a reputation for holding onto the purse strings a little tightly. And I'll admit that we often do very little to change that stereotype. Um, in fact, um, I believe our commitment to fiscal discipline is actually good for Texas. But I also believe that we cannot ignore our responsibility to our fellow man. In fact, I believe that addressing these issues in a proactive and responsible way is often the conservative choice to make. If we make smart investments today, we can reduce costs on our schools, in our criminal justice system, and on our taxpayers later down the road. Uh, I believe it's prudent to help citizens address their behavioral health needs so that they're better able to provide for themselves and to provide for their families. It's also prudent to work with generous and concerned citizens in the private sector, which is exactly what today's launch will allow. This institute has the potential to do more good for our state than any government program. I have every confidence in your leadership to do just that. And in return, you have my commitment that the Texas House wants to support you, that we want to listen to you, and we want to empower you to carry out this most important mission. So I want to say thank you again to the Meadows Foundation, to all of you uh, who support it, and thanks to our House members who are here today uh, in support of this important effort. Thanks to you all for inviting me here this morning. Have a great day, um, and all the best with this uh, incredibly important mission. The Texas House is here with you every step of the way. Thank you. I forgot to say one thing, and I was uh, caught by my efficient staff in saying I should have told each and every one of you to turn off your cell phones, please. We're live streaming this, and we don't need any inadvertent beeps. Thank you. Well, that's a good reminder. Oh, okay, good. Well, uh, Speaker Strauss, thank you so much for being here today and for your, your leadership on this issue and for, for joining us for the launch. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Dr. Andy Keller, and uh, I have the privilege to serve as the Executive Vice President for Policy and Programs at the New Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. Now, what that very long title means is that I'm responsible for the behavioral health policy work and all of the policy deliverables at the Institute that then we will be using through our communications and other um, parts of the Institute to help disseminate and promote best practices. 
I am a clinical and community psychologist, and for the last 20 years, other than maintaining a small clinical practice in the little town where I live, I have dedicated my time to trying to figure out how public finances and public policy can do a better job promoting mental health and other behavioral health services and practices that work. Along with the rest of our policy team, especially Dr. Chris Klein and her partner, Dr. Ken Minkoff from the firm Zia Partners, um, I've been engaged and we've been engaged for two years um, by the Meadows Foundation to take a hard look at an important idea that they had in their strategic plan for mental health for Texans. And that was the idea that Texans deserve a policy institute focused on enabling every Texan to get the mental health care they need when and where they need it. So we had the privilege to travel around this amazing state. We got to meet with hundreds of Texans here in the capital and across dozens of communities. And we toured many programs. We saw many programs that work and many ways to effectively address these needs. We also studied the mental health policy institutes in other states and we learned from their successes as well as from their shortcomings. But most importantly, we hosted town halls across the state to listen to and enlist the people already working on these issues and the people who know where the gaps and the opportunities reside. Many of you today are among those we talk to and the reason we are here today is because of your work. Um, we're joined by many distinguished Texans you've already heard from and will hear from throughout today. But the work we have really stands on the shoulders and depends on folks that have been working in many cases for decades. Our partners at other foundations, universities, state and local government, advocates, and those at the front lines of Texas health systems delivering and receiving care. These folks have been striving for decades to advocate for Texans to have not just an adequate mental health system, but to envision the best health care system in the country. And that is why we've come together and that's why we're here today, to kick that off and help make that a more of a reality. Um, I'm privileged to have, in addition to the other members of the Meadows Foundation, several members of the Meadows Board here today. We have Mr. Lee Rouse, Elizabeth Rouse, and John Broadfoot, who are among the committee members of the board who helped lead this and bring this to be. So thank you for being here today. We also have several staff members from the Institute that I'm going to introduce at different times. I want to introduce two, though, right now. One is Dr. Timothy Dittmer. Tim is our chief, uh, chief economist. He's going to kill me for saying a psychologist. He's an economist. He has nothing to do with psychology, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, Tim joined our team after more than a decade of behavioral health policy consulting and other policy consulting as an economist, and he also um, had just stepped down from serving as the tenured chair of his economics department where he taught for the last 15 years. Tim also grounds our veterans' work with his experience in his service, having um, served two tours in Iraq as a non-commissioned officer where he was awarded the Combat Infantry Badge and the Bronze Star. He's joined by Dr. Christy Klein, who I mentioned earlier, who is one of our physician policy partners at the Institute. In addition to her long policy consulting career, Dr. Klein grew up in Texas. She was past medical director for the state of New Mexico, and she is the proud mom of an Afghanistan veteran. So there are staff that are grounding our policy work in the areas of veterans' mental health. So I'm going to talk about other team members later, but right now what I'd like to do is to introduce our veterans panel. So if folks could, could come on up, panel members. Um, as folks are coming up, I want to tell you that it's not an accident that we are starting our conference today talking about the needs and the successes of Texans who have stood up on behalf of all of us. There are over 1.5 million veterans who call Texas home. You're going to hear from several of them today, and they're going to be talking about the needs of veterans, but not just needs, because we hear a lot about that. We're also going to talk, more importantly, about ways to help and ways to heal. Texas is also home to over 24 million people who, like me, are not veterans. But we share a deep obligation to welcome our fellow Texans home, to help them when needed to heal the wounds of war, not just them, but sometimes also their families, their children. And we, just like every Texan, want to make sure that they have access to the health care they need, and that includes mental health. We have uh, been working closely with representatives of the Veterans Administration. Dr. Steve Holliday is here today from Vision 17. We have many other folks we've talked to. And the data we have from the Veterans Administration, as well as others, t tells us overwhelmingly that we know that while the Vet VA is striving valiantly to meet the needs of veterans, they can't do it by themselves. I mean, in fact, even if they were fully at capacity and serving every veteran who is eligible for care, not every veteran is. We've been fighting these wars for a long time, and there's a lot of folks that need help. So we're here today 
to really make a very simple policy point that the state of Texas and Texas communities need to take the lead to stand alongside the VA, to stand alongside our veterans, and to fill these gaps. So I'd like to introduce our panelists right now. Um, our panel is being chaired today by Dr. Kyle Janik. Dr. Janik is the Executive Commissioner of the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Dr. Janik was appointed by Governor Perry in 2012 after eight years in the Texas House and five years in the State Senate. He's a board certified anesthesiologist and he's been in private practice since 1986. So thank you, Dr. Janik, for your chairing of this session today. Um, we're also joined today by Representative and Dr. John Zerwas. He is in his fourth term and represents the Northwest Fort Bend County. During his tenure, Representative Zerwas has worked to increase transparency for health consumers. He sought to save lives by updating our organ, organ donation laws here in the state. In 2011, Representative Zerwas passed legislation designed to save more than $400 million by making Medicaid more cost effective, which is our goal here at the Institute as well. Everyone in this room knows Dr. Zerwas as the House's intellectual leader in medical issues, and we are honored to have him here today talking about these issues. It is also our honor to have Mr. Jake Schick here today. Jake is with the Brain Performance Institute. He's the, part of their warrior training team. He leads that at the Center for Brain Health in Dallas. Jake is a third generation Marine. He was severely wounded in service in 2004 while conducting combat operations in the Al Ambar province. And today, Jake draws on the lessons of his own recovery and service to help other veterans across Texas and across the country. We're also honored to have Ms. Tausha Bar Paxton Barnes here today. Um, Tausha is the Veteran Volunteer Coordinator for the Military Veteran Peer Network Texas Panhandle Centers in Amarillo and Plainview, and she only has to cover the needs of veterans in 30 counties. <laughs> for her Army service, she was awarded a National Defense Service Medal, an Afghanistan Campaign Medal, and a Global War on Terrorism Service Medal. She began her career in mental health with, by establishing the program Grace Out, uh, After Fire, which was designed for female veterans, so we're thrilled to have her here today. Commissioner Janik? Turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Keller. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Keller. And uh, a couple of housekeeping points. I think we were scheduled to start at 9:15 and wrap what 10 o'clock. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. Um, but we're starting early, so we get a little extra time. Um, thank you to uh, Tom Luce and to the Meadows Foundation for the creation of the institute. This is enormously important. Uh, because for so long, uh, the uh, discussion about mental health, as Tom pointed out, has been sort of kept over there, you know, in another room, and it wasn't in the place where everybody could bring it out there and talk about it through the efforts of groups like the Hogg Foundation and like the Meadows Foundation, Foundation and now with the Me Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute for Texas. There is a better opportunity for a broader discussion of these issues, and this is a terrific time to do it. I'm especially pleased with the involvement of the leadership. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit with the Q&A, but uh, about six months ago, the governor called me and he said, you know, there's, I've had some discussions with a fellow uh, that I know, a, a veteran who suffers from PTSD, and he got some terrific help at the Carrick Brain Center in Irving, Texas. Janet, get up there and find out if there's something to this, and if so, what can we do about it to get some more veterans through there? In that look, I discovered the UT Center for Brain Health uh, at UT Dallas, and what they're doing in some fairly amazing ways. And so we were able to find some amount of money through the budget, the session was long over, but we found that money that was in the budget for these kinds of services and directed it so that we could get 50 veterans in each of these through them. And we did it in um, a rigorous fashion in that we had every vet undergo a pre and post assessment to determine not just do you think you're better, but whether can we, can we put that on paper in a standardized fashion to um, assess whether either of these modalities, they're non-drug therapies, very different these two, but they're non-drug therapies, they're not long-term therapies in terms of having someone, you know, participate for the next three, four, five years, but rather to see whether we can make a difference in a short period of time. The jury's still out, but I can tell you the early look at some of that data is very promising. So from the governor and the lieutenant governor, the speaker, by the way, did you notice it just wasn't the speaker? It's important to have the speaker. Mrs. Strauss was here. 
And I don't know if you pay attention to those kinds of signals, but when I see the spouse of the speaker or the governor, I sit up a little extra. <laughs> it's tough to get on his schedule, and it's even tougher to capture the attention of the spouse of these folks. And so having uh, Mrs. Strauss show up was a tremendous signal. Am I overreading that? I don't think I am. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. Um, Here's the thing, and it's not just appropriate, and, and we're so blessed to have Meadows doing what they're doing, but to do it in the first panel to be uh, centered around veterans is even more important, in my opinion. Here's why. We take these veterans, strip them of their civilian clothes, make them one. All six of you, all 600 of you become one. You don't worry about yourself, you worry about your comrade. We make them into one unit. We send them off doing ungodly things to keep us safe. And when they come back, we give them their civilian clothes, we give them some help, we say, thank you very much for your service, and they stand there and say, wait a minute, where's my team? Well, so-and-so's in Seattle, and the other one's back in Puerto Rico, and one's actually fairly close in Lubbock across the state. Where's my team? We made them into a team. We sent them through boot camp. We bring them back, but we don't do a good enough job, in my opinion, of reintegrating them. We owe it to them. But we're going to put them into service one more time, and here's how. Because this issue is difficult for people to talk about, maybe there's something that's just not quite right. We make it hard for people to talk about it. But when you have a decorated veteran, a wounded veteran, when you have a United States and U.S. Navy SEAL or an Army Ranger or a sergeant or a grunt, anybody from the military who put themselves in the, in, in the line of fire for our freedom, when they stand next to you and say, you know what, it is okay to talk about it, everybody will breathe a sigh of relief. We're seeing some of this now. When I went to both UT Dallas and to the Carrick Brain Center, I spoke with some of the veterans. And I'll never forget this. Um, there was a group of about four, I think three of them were former Navy SEALs, serious looking individuals, right? And they're standing there talking and I said, well, we found some money in the budget. It wasn't exactly marked for this, but it was important. It's mental health dollars and we're gonna do it and I'm gonna see if it works. And if it doesn't, I'm gonna have to go, go explain to a bunch of uh, legislators what I did with the money and, and I, I'm gonna make the case for you. And this one fellow said, you want us to go with you? <laughs> I laughed, but then I said, you know what? Actually, yes, I may. <laughs> so we're each going to just make some remarks. I want to, again, thank the Meadows Foundation for what they've done for creating this Health Policy Institute, Mental Health Policy Institute. It's so important. And um, I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for Q&A. We're going to do a bunch of questions internally, but then we'll do the Q&A from the floor. Is that, is that the program, Dr. Keller? Uh, two last introductions, if I may. I want to introduce Judge John Specia. Judge Specia is our commissioner for the Department of Family and Protective Services. Um, I, a whole other discussion one day about CPS in particular, adult protective services and many missions, but child protective services and what they do. Judge Specia came to me having been on the bench for years in Bear County and adjudicating these child protective services cases. He came to me and he said, as before I even tried to get him to take the job, I said, just come on up and talk to me for a little bit and take an afternoon, not, not very long. And he said, one of the problems you've got is that you've got silos. And so you may have a family who is stressed and they need help on the mental health side, but you've got those programs somewhere else. You've got to break down those silos. He's also impressed on me the importance of addressing military families who are stressed and the ability for us, the need for us to get CPS caseworkers who understand that culture. And so you send somebody into someone's living room and you say, it's going to be stressful, it's going to be tense, they're going to know that maybe there's a chance you could take their child out of there if you think their child is harmed and all that sort of thing. And this is a different culture under different stresses and we need to address that. Judge Specia is doing a terrific job on this front. One last introduction uh, is Dr. Uh, Don Cunning, uh, 
Don Buckingham, excuse me, Don, I've only known each other for 15 or 20 years. Dr. Buckingham is uh, another uh, appointee to the Sunset Commission. Uh, she's an appoint, appointee by uh, the Lieutenant Governor. Sunset Commission is gonna be tremendously important in this issue and all issues, health and human services in the, uh, in the session coming up. So with that, I'll shut up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Commissioner, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to be part of this forum. I uh, obviously am not uh, Jose Menendez, uh, and I think that's, uh, unfortunately for you all, uh, 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 Jose is, truly is uh, one of the expert in the house on veterans issues in general, and certainly along the lines of mental health. And so uh, I am more than honored and, and, and uh, privileged to get to sit up here with this panel. Uh, I certainly am, am not the best equipped person, but frequently when you're the person that's kind of doling out the dollars in the, in the legislature, uh, people get very friendly with you and stuff. And so I, 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 I take this as, as a great opportunity, though, to sit and talk a little bit about the issue that is very, very important to me, not only from a, an appropriator and, and, and funding point of view, but from the policy side of things. Uh, mental health has been one of those issues that during my uh, tenure in the legislature has bubbled up and, and is an enormously important uh, issue that the state has to face and one that we can make great strides in. And the establishment of this institute uh, by virtue of this foundation stepping up and, and really finding a way to, to make this happen is going to make a big difference, not just in the veterans health issues, but in you know, mental health issues in, in general. And uh, uh, I think it's, it's great that you're having a session here separate on veterans' mental health issues because it is unique. It does require a, a different kind of approach, I think. I think you still have to step back, though, and look at it. Why do we struggle with mental health in general? Why do we struggle as a society with recognizing that mental health is a disease? You know, we didn't have any trouble really getting to the point that we said obesity was a disease. That's been, that's been formally codified in that, in that fashion, you know, that, that obesity is a disease. And we know it. We know that. We know what happens as a consequence of it. And we know there's interventions that, uh, as physicians, we can, we can make a difference there. You know, we also know there are behavioral changes that we can make in obesity. And we fully accepted that. But we still struggle with the idea that somebody who has a mental health problem is, is some, somehow weak. That somehow is something that you could have controlled that. You know, Jake, I know you dealt with this probably in your journey, and, and I'm going to be short because I think what you're going to hear from my other fellow panelists here is going to be much more telling than what I can share with you. Um, but, but I think that until we step back from that and we as society start to really better embrace that, if you have mental health, it's no different than you have some other kind of physical health issue. It's no different than if you have a cardiac condition, a kidney condition, a pulmonary condition a gallbladder that's gone sour and that requires extended treatment to get better on. Things that we're all very familiar with and comfortable with. And we don't have, and, and most, for the most part, insurance has no problem funding those kinds of things. And so I think it's very important for institutes like this that are going to really help bring this to the forefront of society that's going to allow us to get just in a better policy position to recognize that this is a challenge and something that we need to step up and deal with. Let's talk about the veterans' issues uniquely, though, as something that we need to deal with. Uh, here is a population, as uh, Commissioner Janik laid out, that we send into the theaters of war, <laughs> and we expect them to just come back and automatically integrate into society, you know, especially the people who have been at the front, front edge of the battle. Uh, my, my oldest sister is a trauma surgeon in the Army. In fact, right now she is in a forward hospital in Afghanistan. This is her third deployment in a theater of war. Um, and, and she will tell you straight up, you know, that these warriors that we create, <laughs> that we train, that go out there to protect us and, you know, really seal our safety and protect our liberties and our freedoms and so forth, they are incredibly well-trained people. And they have state-of-the-art technology to help them accomplish their mission. But they come back a different person. They come back a different person. And for us to think for a moment that that is not and a condition that is related to, you know, some kind of weakness out there is wrong. And I think that having this panel, discussing this today, is certainly one of those great strides toward starting to
put an extra four million dollars into our budget. But don't let me stop there and say for a moment that that is the only amount of money. I'm going to pull my little handy thing out. When you're a, a, a panelist that fills in, uh, nothing scares your staff more than that. Because what they're immediately going to say is, okay, you know, what, what is the amount of money? And, and I see these little dots coming up right now, you know, on my little, my little crib notes here and stuff. You know, I said, I want to know how much money we spend on veterans' mental health. That is not a single line item in our budget. It is something that is, uh, there we go, very good, very good, Megan, wherever you are, and Heather, I know you all are out here and with me, uh, and so thank you for that. Uh, but, but we have, in fact, uh, spent substantially more money than that uh, in terms of our, our, our budgeting. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, we mentioned the $4 million, but in fact, we spend, um, uh, I think the number is right, if I've got it here, 850 um, uh, million dollars, is that the right number, Megan? Raise your hand if you're out there, I know you, yes. $850,000, okay, that, that are spent on, on mental health uh, uh, conditions and so forth for veterans. This is not a place where we can capture a single uh, line item in there in terms of what do we devote to mental health conditions veterans. Uh, Chairman Turner, Sylvester Turner was deeply involved in this. We worked very closely together uh, to really kind of do some things with mental health that as he and I like to phrase as transformational. And uh, the speaker mentioned he takes my thunder and I'm glad to have him take my thunder. It's always uh, better for the speaker to have it than the, than the panelists. Uh, but $263 million was appropriated over and above the 2.7 billion dollars overall that's in the budget. 2.7 billion dollars that's overall in the budget and we put an extra $263 million in there for mental health conditions in general. He mentioned some of the specific things that we're looking at trying to do. Uh, that is a transformational amount of money. When we talk to the people on the ground that are dealing with mental health issues, they say that is money that is going to make a difference in terms of how we do things. Uh, we need to not forget that there are additional things that we can do with the veteran community out there. They have a unique condition, they have unique situations. And another good point, uh, uh, you know, Commissioner, that was brought up in our hearing yesterday, we talked about the, the children of, of, uh, of the, um, the, the, the military families and children in El Paso as a consequence of that particular base are not the same as children um, in Fort Hood nor any other base out there. They have unique warriors that are all there for different reasons and so forth and their families are subject Jake, to different circumstances and stuff and they require different kinds of treatment. So there is no boilerplate way of saying okay your military automatically you get these two drugs go to this therapy over here and you'll be better in about 18 weeks. You know that's that's not going to work, you know. Every one of these is unique. The conditions are unique in the situations that we have out there. And we, as at least the, the policymakers and ultimately as the appropriators, we need to be sure that we're funneling that money in the right way. The speaker said it well, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're a little bit tight with the money. Uh, I think that's what Texas wants us to be, but we need to be sure that strategically we're sending that money in the right way that can be used in the best opportunity uh, for treatment of mental health and the veteran population is uniquely a population that we need to be sure uh, that we're doing the right things. This institute's going to, I think, be very, very pivotal in helping us get to the right place. I look forward to the opportunity to participate in those discussions uh, in the upcoming session and certainly in the interim. So with that, Commissioner, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheck. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'd like to piggyback on what you just said, Doc, and that's a great point that we are all unique, uh, regardless of what we did in the military, regardless of the branch we were in, where we served, our families, we are all unique. And the kind of the uniform treatment that we get once we separate from, now I want to make this clear too, active duty military medicine is outstanding medicine. It really is great medicine. Some of the best treatments and in, in, uh, surgeries and operations I've ever had, and I'm well versed in that. I've had over 50 operations and 23 blood transfusions, so it's like riding a bike after a while. But the, when, you, when you transition from active duty service and you move over into the VA healthcare system, you know, it's a stress system. We're, we're a large group. My brothers and sisters, we make up a big population. But at the same time, we are all unique. We all have different needs. And uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, the VA is not going to be able to do it on its own. And that's why there's places like the Brain Performance Institute, the Center for Brain Health, and places like Carrick, and, and places like 
Grace Under Fire, which I'm familiar with that Tasha helped, helped uh, create. But uh, one thing as a severely wounded warrior that I've learned is, um, you know, I spent about six years in the Marine Corps, um, and I'm very proud of that. I'm uberly proud to call myself a United States Marine because it's a title that I fought for and I scratched for and that I earned. And when they gave me that first Eagle Globe and Anchor, even though my last name's Schick, he's still, because it wasn't graduation, they wouldn't call me by my last name, my drill instructor, but uh, I'll let you decipher what I was referred to as for three months. <laughs> but um, I was a squad leader and our guide's name was Schmitter, so you can do two and two. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's, yeah. That's the Marines for you. Got more mind games than Milton Bradley. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I'm, I'm extremely proud of the United States Marine. I wouldn't trade my service for anything in the world. Uh, look, I just had a bad day at work, okay? I made a promise to this country. I made a promise to my family that I would go and be the best fighting man that this country could possibly make me be. And I was. I did my best. I had a bad day. My enemy got me, but they didn't win. I'm still breathing, so joke's on them. Great try. But my physical wounds were so detrimental, and I know you can't tell now, but if I was in shirts and t-shirt, it'd be abundantly apparent that something bad happened. And uh, I spent about 18 months total in the hospital, in and out of rehab and therapy and surgeries, and I struggled real bad with um, the Asanita Bactrin that's in the sand in Iraq really tore me up and I had multiple, multiple infections. That's where a lot of my surgeries came from. And then reconstruction of my left arm, my left leg, same thing. And I uh, lost my right leg, so that wasn't much of an issue. That, you know, that's, they cut it off and that's it. Uh, but I trained for so long and mastered various weapons and weapon systems to make me the most effective fighting warrior and Marine that I could be that this country's taxpayer money could create. <coughs> and I prided myself on that. And all my brothers and my sisters in the Marines, although I was a grunt, so I was 0311 rifle, 0331 machine gunner, if you're curious, we all did that. And we prided ourselves in that. So when I get home and I get these physical injuries retreated, because they were significant, that's where the focus was. They did not focus, unfortunately, on the traumatic brain injury and the post-traumatic stress. And I was blown 30 feet out of the top of a Hummer, landed on my head. I never lost consciousness or went into shock. Ergo, post-traumatic stress. <laughs> uh, but that landing, as a good Marine does, stuck it with my head again. There's your TBI. The first reaction, re and the second reaction, the first reaction being the explosion, and that's not really what does the damage to the brain. It's the second reaction of the brain shifting around in the skull. So that happened to me on multiple occasions. Look, the IED that got me wasn't the first IED that I went through. And uh, so I, I trained hard to be the best Marine I could be, best Marine this country could, could make me. And when I come home and I get out, I medically retire from the Marine Corps, it's almost like a you know, high five, pat on the rear, and thanks, warrior, appreciate your service. And then I lose that purpose and that camaraderie and that brotherhood that I've become so accustomed to that made me tick, not only as a Marine, but as a human being. And when you lose that sense of community and that sense of pride and purpose, you lose a lot that goes with it. You suffer tremendously. And let me tell you something, I am well versed in physical pain and mental pain. And I can say with conviction that mental pain is 10 times worse than physical pain. I would rather be blown up all over again than have to leave my brothers on the battlefield. Worst, worst experience in my life, not being hit by the bomb, but being put on that bird alone and leaving my Marines. That was the worst experience of my life. So luckily, I found the Center for Brain Author, they found me, rather, 
actually a Navy SEAL directed me there, and a great friend of mine. And he said, you know, Jay, can you go get your brain screw up? And I was like, no, I don't. There's nothing wrong with my brain, bro. He's like, yeah. okay, just go get your brain screw up. And we played this back and forth for a long time, because look, as a warrior, last thing you want to do is admit something's going on neck up. That six inches between your ears is private territory. You keep it private to your individual warrior, the end. Because once you admit something is going on, you might as well throw in the towel because you're done. Because then, again, the stigma that comes with admitting that you're struggling with your mental health is, is de a detriment to your career as a warrior, regardless of your job in the military. So luckily when I went to the Center for Brain Health, and of course, I was very skeptical. Because being a severely wounded Marine, I've had everybody and their dog tell me, hey, come see us, we can help you, come do this. You know, I didn't want to take any more drugs. When I got out of the hospital after 18 months, I was a drug addict, government issued drug addict. Not by choice, and not by the government's choice, but that's just the way it works. When you have that many operations and that many physical wounds, the one thing the hospital can do is maintain your pain level. Well, guess what? When you take pain medication for that long, it's got to go up because you get tolerant to it. So yeah, I mean, I left a drug addict. It wasn't anybody's fault. It's just the way it is. But I struggled. I struggled to kick that. And then the self-medication started. When they gave me a big bag of drugs when I left Brook Army Medical Center, I, I just thought to myself, I pretty much know how this is going to go down. Because if two works, I bet you four is awesome. And uh, so that's the self-medication process. But when I showed up, I was very skeptical because I've had so many people tell me, Jake, this is going to help you. Come try this. Come do this. And finally, my SEAL brother told me, hey, Jake, just give it a try. You have nothing to lose. And he was right. And I said, you know what? I'll do it on three conditions. Out of respect for you and the fact that you said that it works and I'm going to do it is great. But three, if this doesn't work, we're going to see how good you Sewell's hand-to-hand -hand combat is. <laughs> and, um, but nonetheless, I went, showed up angry because I'm a product of past experience and I was skeptical. And luckily, by Wednesday, I knew something amazing was happening, and I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was amazing. And by the fifth day, I knew that I had the ability to think my brain healthier and make me an amazing cognitive performer. Just the way I, know, I learned how to master weapons and weapon systems in the Marine Corps, Center for Brain Health taught me how to master my mind to make me the most effective civilian I could possibly be. Ergo, made me a better husband and a better daddy. And you can't put a price on that. Because my wife has suffered more than anybody in this entire ordeal. And she actually, actually happens to be, she was an intern in the Navy at Bethesda. And that's how we met. She was an LT and I was a corporal, but Commandant of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major told me they both had my back. And they said, go get her double dog. And I said, roger that. <laughs> so, but uh, now we have a three-year-old son. And um, I'll tell you what, she's been a champion. She's been an absolute champion because had I married anyone else who didn't know that this was going to be a marathon and not a sprint, I guarantee you I'd be divorced because she stuck it out. She stuck it out, and uh, she, is, she always talks about how she's not good at the public speaking or being a leader. Let me tell you something. She's the most effective leader I've ever met, and I've met some good ones. Uh, the spouses and the caregivers, man, they suffer so much, and, and it's true. We have gotten so much light and so much spotlight since these wars have kicked off in Iraq and Afghanistan that unfortunately the spouses, the caregivers, the children have kind of fallen by the wayside and they just kind of try and stay afloat in our wake. And it's not hard because we leave a massive wake. Depending on how severe our symptoms are, trust me, it, it can be bad. And luckily, we have the ability to train them just as the, the way that we train our, our warriors and my brothers and sisters to let them know, hey, let's stay accountable. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's do the best we can do together. One team, one fight, just like we say in the military. One team, 
one fight. And the family dynamic is the most important thing that any of these military men or women can uh, embrace because without it, when you don't have that support system, uh, that's a lonely, lonely fight. And by the grace of God, I do. Because uh, had I not, I would probably be a statistic. And that's what this ring represents, is the 22 warriors that commit suicide every day, that lose their battles with PTS or TBI. And I tell you what, I will wear this ring proudly because I know four people, three of which I fought with, who have taken their lives by their own hand, one of which was a good friend of mine who is actually a double amputee. And I'll guarantee you this, he didn't take his life because he's a double amputee. And with that, I'll pass it on to Now, by the way, yes, you are going to. Thank you, Mr. Schick, and yes, you are going with me in front of the appropriators next year. Roger that. Good to go, sir. <laughs> Ms. Barnes? Um, I remember, you know, at nine and ten years of age, my dad, Marine Vietnam veteran, waking up in the middle of the night, um, screaming, having fits and rage, and little did I know, 20 years later, um, you know, I'm in my small town of Tulia, Texas with my husband and uh, an alarm goes off. Uh, alarming the community, a tornado is hit ground and in the middle of the night I'm waking up looking for my M16 and that was the same alarm sound that was going off in Afghanistan when we would get mortared. And I'm going, you know, I'm back in USA going, why am I acting like this? What's wrong with me? Um, you know, months down the line, I'm, I'm still unemployed, and why can't I find a job? I was successful in the military, and you know, all these mental health issues are coming up, and I kept asking myself, why am I feeling this way? What, why, why am I acting this way? What am I not doing? And it finally took a friend, um, a very good friend of 15 years, literally taking me by the hand and getting me connected to the resources that, the limited resources that were there in Amarillo. Um, but by her taking that time and, and seeing that change in me, kept me little by little recluse and, you know, I commend her because it was her that made that change uh, for me. Not only did she get me uh, connected into this line of work, uh, which as they said, led into Grace After Fire. You know, I connected with a lot of female veterans and put the military sexual trauma into it, its proper perspective. So I'm very honored and proud to be where I am, and that's connected now with the Military Veteran Peer Network. Um, I don't think society, Texans, have a, a grasp of what connecting, whether it's camaraderie, trust, dealing with mental health issues, TBI, PTSD, military sexual trauma. There's just a, a wide variety of issues with, that face veterans and families today. But if we educate ourselves as a society, as uh, Texas residents, we're, we can be in a better state that loves their veterans and supports the cause. And there's so many resources out there so part of our job is to educate even at the minimal level in your community. Educate them, whether it's mental health first aid, whether it's you know, peer support group, uh, finding counselors. As they said, my, my job, I cover 30 counties and it is a lot of territory to cover, but I'm very honored and proud to do so because not one veteran or family member or child is worth losing over this cause. Um, I'm very proud to say that through this military veteran peer network, even in you know rural Amarillo, Texas, we had last year um, a fellow Army soldier, active soldier, 
who had contacted his church uh, in Amarillo, and he was about to commit suicide. But by connecting as far as Colleen, Texas, to Amarillo, Texas, then connecting to me, we were able to help him, and he is our success story. And every community in Texas should have success stories like that because you save that one life. Those staggering statistics of 22, it's, it's on the up and up, and it doesn't need to be that way. We have the resources, we have the tools, we just have to educate. We have to be that handout, not, or hand up rather. We can't just, oh, well, here's the information. Mm -hmm. You know, society, Facebook. Until you realize the veteran, somewhat proud, but also frustrated within themselves, and the family member frustrated because they want to help until you literally take them by the hand. Sometimes that's what it takes. And getting them connected to that resource and that person, um, then they get connected. And, and that journey, that positive journey, um, begins the healing process. You know, we recently connected um, a family that their, their soldier, he was killed in action. And by the veteran service officer in that small rural county with limited resources that he had, he was able to connect with the Military Veteran Peer Network and we were able to get that soldier's five children and his wife counseling. Um, you know, those are the success stories that maybe sometimes Austin doesn't hear, but it is a working, powerful network I mean, I'm blessed to have met Jake now, and certainly we'll use him as a resource in Dallas, Texas, with the traumatic brain injury work that they're doing. Um, so I'm very blessed and honored. Uh, I advocate on behalf um, of families, of, of veterans, of children. I was one that grew up in that environment. I became a veteran. Uh, but I'm a success story. You know, you don't give up. That's certainly the, the military does a wonderful training uh, in training you to be a soldier. But like Jake and I were discussing, that transition and separation, you know, a lot of policies and changes need to be made uh, because until your, your community level is educated um, and advocates on behalf, uh, for the families and, and the children and veterans. Um, you know, we're going to have these staggering statistics of suicide, and nobody wants to become that community, you know, where um, a trigger point happens and, and it's a mass killing. Nobody, even small little, you know, Hereford, Texas, in my county. But until we educate counselors, um, pastors, school educators, everybody in, in that community, that it's okay, you know, there, there is stigma with mental health, but educate them that, you know, this stigma is only there if you allow it to be, because there's wonderful treatments out there, there's, there's so many ways to get connected. I'm very, like I said, I'm very proud to be a, a part of the Military Veteran Peer Network and, and the work that we do. So. Thank each and every one of you uh, for your support. Um, it does make a huge difference uh, on behalf of us veterans when we return. So thank you. Well, we thank you for your service. made me think most of us wake up Ms. Barnes uh, to an alarm clock and it's, is it safe to assume that there's not a snooze button on an M16 they don't yeah when that, when that alarm goes you got to be moving right yeah. brings up an interesting point uh, I spoke with one veteran who said he thinks that much of what afflicts him is that startled response PTSD whatever it is but it's that startled response when he hears a loud noise and he knows he is trained to do something, 
to jump into action. But it turns out it was a car backfiring and there's no threat. And he feels, as he described it, uh, I, think he said, I think he said the word guilty. He feels guilty for being afraid when he's trained to respond and fight. And yet there's nothing to fight. And so it comes back to him. There's no way to take that startled feeling, that fight, flight, fight or flight phenomenon and externalize it. There is nothing to do, but rather it's just back on you. Car backfired, everybody else is walking around, everything looks normal, and, and yet his pulse is racing and he's ready to go do something. And he thinks that that sort of directing it back into himself is a big part of that problem. We have so much to learn and we'll do it with, with groups like uh, the Center for Brain Health and others. But first we've got to get the science piece right. Uh, the legislature has put the money there. And then they not only put the money there, they directed me to hire somebody at the commission, at the executive commissioner's level, to, to coordinate these things. And we're so blessed to have Sonia Gaines, where Sonia, Sonia was with the local mental health authority in Tarrant County and uh, is an expert in these matters. And so she's helping us to coordinate some of these things. So the legislature's put some money in. Am I rustling here? Is that me? Sorry. All right. I dropped my microphone twice already. Um, so legislature's put the money in. The governor's given me clear direction. Janet, get off your keister and get something done with the veterans and, their, and, and the mental health issues. Um, how do we find the veterans? How do, we, how do we reach them? I think I know an answer, but I want to hear it from you. you know, well, again, uh, in the rural communities, you know, we're rather large, uh, 30 counties in the Panhandle. Um, sometimes there there is a disconnect. There's it's a lot of farming and ranching, so you know it's very easy to find those veterans in a tractor plowing the field. Um, you know, still working on mom and dad's ranch. So um, obviously, with just myself. Uh, you know, it's two and four hour drive to those very remote rural areas. But by going to that community, um, we offer stakeholders meetings. We allow everybody in the community to come and we either provide mental health first aid training um, with the mindset that these are certain things to look for, um, you know, as a family member or, uh, you know, a friend. Then we offer, um, you know, here's some resources, here's the counseling. Find a counselor that's in your community willing to donate an hour. Um, you know, social media, we, we try to attend rural uh, health fairs. That's a great opportunity as well um, to get the community connected to resources. Because who's gonna better know what that trigger would be for that veteran than that remote family member or that employer or that local pastor at the church. If they are educated at the fundamental level of where the resources are and how to build that trust and build that connect, that conversation opportunity, because eventually that veteran will. Once that, that trust is built, it's like Jake said, once we get together and we feel that camaraderie, the wives are just the same. And you get a group of wives together and they'll, they'll start sharing, oh, I thought that was just something that my husband was going through. I mean, even my wake up call, um, you know, in returning, I have a, a very, uh, even probably minority, I have a husband that he didn't deploy. How many husbands are out there and, and dealing with when his wife went to combat and that man being, you know, prideful and saying, well, uh, I should be the one there, but, you know, my wife's there. Uh, how, how, how he had to cope with it and, and what he struggled with uh, while I was deployed. You know, even that very small population of men, you know, where's their support group? Where's their, I, I need to vent, I need to let this out. I need to share this, you know. So again, it's just going to the very rural area that McDonald's, wherever they're congregating, that Walmart, um, you know, and educating the flyers, presenting the information. I guarantee you, now that um, we have connected with Jake, um, 
I get calls all the time in, in even small rural area of Amarillo in the Panhandle region. We don't have a lot of the resources that probably Houston, San Antonio, and Austin, Dallas have. But by connecting to them, I guarantee you we're able to assist that veteran in Dumas, Texas because of via some contact in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I think you hit it. What, what I would have said, and maybe you're so close to it, it's, you don't see something that's obvious to somebody outside that circle of warriors, and that is this. I, I can't find you. Y'all find each other. Right. And so a year and a half ago, the American Statesman did that series of articles on the veterans who come back, and, and, and it was very enlightening uh, to me. And, and that was the first discussion I'd had with the governor on this specific topic. He said, again, Get, get busy, you know, get your bureaucrat self out there and get something done on this. And we started to look at how do we find them, but it's a different war. You're not of my father's generation, World War II and the Korean conflict. You find each other, and what we came to understand was that you don't go to the VFW hall. That was, that was someone else's generation. Your generation, to the extent that I could stereotype, is more apt to uh, congregate at the McDonald's you know, stereotypically get on the Harleys and do the, you know, ride through the, you find each other and um, our difficulty is knowing how to get in there or at least make ourselves available. At the commission, Dr. Susanna Hupp, our Associate Commissioner for Veterans Initiative, uh, has created a phone app and it's a very simple app, Texas Veterans app, it's on the iTunes store and all that stuff um, and it's got I think four simple functional buttons. I've got it on my phone. Everybody could have it on their phone before they walk out of here today. It's free. Um, Veterans Crisis Hotline, the 800 number, nationwide. Uh, connect to a veteran to the peer-to-peer -peer network for a local peer-to-peer. -peer. Talk to somebody that understands this because Janet doesn't understand it, right? Um, women's uh, Veterans Hotline and a portal to the uh, Texas Veterans Portal to the Veterans Commission. So um, those, you'll find each other, but that was a stroke of brilliance on the part of Dr. Hupp because uh, it gives you the way to do it. You don't ask for help, right? That, is that fair to say? You don't ask for help. That's but you make it okay for other people to talk about it by virtue of y'all talking together. Is that? Yeah, I, I, I'd agree to an extent. I think that the biggest thing, um, with what I found is being around my fellow brothers and sisters is that, you know, once we leave military service, regardless of the respective branch, you know, we're bitten by the service bug. Bug. We we want to continue that service in one way, shape, or form. And I think that the various nonprofits, and I could sit here and name 15 credible ones right now. I mean, you're going to find. 850 to a million post 9-11 warriors just in those nonprofits that are involved in them and helping move our various military initiatives forward to let these veterans know, hey, you don't have to be labeled. You can be empowered. Let's empower you. You know, because it's easy to be labeled. It's tough to be empowered. That's why we're all about meeting people where they are where they are. You know, let's not make them come to, to come to us. Let's meet them halfway. Meet them where they are. Not expect more than you know, they already have enough on their plate. When he or she comes home and separates and does the whole gamut of getting out of active duty or reserve or guard and then go, going into the civilian sector, I mean, unless they are, I've not met one that hasn't said that was a struggle. I have not met one, and I've met lots. And uh, I just think that we, we need to utilize, especially the VA, we've got to utilize the various nonprofits that are operating around the, around the country that are doing great work. and. Uh, and, and, and just know that's where you're going to find a big number of us because, you know, we ride together, we die together, and that's how we, we get back together is with these nonprofits uh, around the country. And that puts different forms of the branches together. It's not all Marines in one, an Army in another. It's everybody together. It's just like stateside when we can make jokes with Army, Navy, Marine, Air Force, the Coast Guard. Yeah, but I guarantee you, you go to Iraq or Afghanistan, it's one team, one fight. Doesn't matter what branch, you talk to them, that's my brother, that's my sister, doesn't matter. One team, one fight. When you get out of the military, same thing. Not all the time. There's still some joking. You've got to have to pass time. But, <laughs> but still, you know, like Tasha, my sister, regardless. You know, his sister, my sister. That's the way it is. One team, one fight. 
Dr. Zerwas, one of the things I think that is in front of us is uh, for such a long period of time, the, the science of psychiatry and the science of neurology have been separate. And yet, with each passing year, Dr. Klein, I think you'd agree with me, we start to see them meld. It's a better understanding of how the physical and the emotional, if you will, the psychiatry is both the science and the, and the art of, of what takes place in the human psyche. Um, neurology is a little more concrete in terms of how do the neurons connect and what happens. And um, I, I think you'd agree with me as a physician that we, more research as we march down that road is going to show us a whole lot more about how to approach some of these problems. I, I agree totally with you, and I mean, if we look at the examples, and uh, you know, the uh, Chairman Luce mentioned it in his opening comments, when you focus minds and money on something, whatever the disease might be, you're going to find cures, remedies, and best ways to treat certain things. Breast cancer, no exception to that. I mean, you know, one in ten women are going to have some kind of a breast cancer. That's an enormous uh, number, as you know. Mm -hmm. But yet we're seeing very, very effective treatments. We're seeing survivors, you know, many, many years out from breast cancer. Uh, yet when we look at other cancers, we're not seeing that. Uh, and, and it's similar, uh, I think, in the area of the mind, if you will, and, and brain science in general, that we have, we have so many things yet to be discovered and to uh, be dealt with that that we're going to find you know, some, some great treatments for it. The whole, the whole area of neurochemistry, I think we're continuing to make great discoveries on, but yet we have so far to go. Uh, we, we don't, you know, we're, we're kind of a society of give me a pill and make me better so I can go about and do what I want to do. Um, and, and, and we struggle with that to some degree because that's sort of maybe to some extent limiting our ability to want to move farther along in terms of discoveries in neuroscience and what are the best treatments and, and things of that nature and stuff. But, but with what we have right now, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we're much farther along. But if we, as you have alluded to, you know, do something uh, that's, that's transformational in terms of pushing money into an area that can really drive research, uh, we know that there will be great things that happen. And the whole Cancer Institute that, uh, that we took on, you know, a, a couple of sessions ago to fund $3 billion over 10 years, you know, to find discoveries and cures for various cancers out there and stuff, is, is going to reap a lot of rewards, uh, you know, for, for this state. Similar types of efforts, you know, in the area of neuroscience and, uh, and, and brain science, if you can differentiate those two, uh, I think we would likewise see, see some, uh, some similar, you know, great accomplishments in that area. Dr. John Hart at the UT, uh, UT Dallas Center for Brain Health. Is, I was visiting him last week. I went and visited both uh, Carrick Brain Center and UT Dallas. And uh, Dr. Hart was talking to me about how our brain, he was showing me that different parts of our brains respond according to what kind of threat we're confronted with. And so uh, he has demonstrated through, I think it was through functional MRIs, that one part of the brain will light up if you're confronted with a man-made threat and a different part of the brain lights up if you're confronted with a more natural threat. A gun pointed at you is different than a tornado bearing down on you. And that's fascinating that the brain will have different fear centers, as he calls them, different fear centers in different parts. The startle of a loud noise lights up in a different place yet. And the startle from a loud noise, they have done some fascinating studies to show that the startle of a loud noise gunfire elicits the same fear response as the startle of a loud noise, somebody laughing very loudly, often. And they've done some studies to show that, and it's kind of just kind of interesting, it was more about the amplitude, the loudness of that noise, and not necessarily that threat. So we've got so much to learn in these, but the fact that is that there are folks out there doing that kind of research, and we just need to do more and get better at the science. And the science will help eliminate some of the stigma. When you can show that sort of a thing that shows up in a book, right, a picture, you know, oh, well, it must be true, you know, it showed up on an MRI scan then it makes it easier for folks to at least know where the demon is, what are we confronting. And I hope you don't mind, Mr. Schick, me pointing this out. You did it yourself earlier. In some ways, you made it okay for people to have a prosthetic leg. Mm -hmm. 
I went to the uh, Scottish Rite Hospital in Dallas where the severely uh, injured kids, uh, wh whether it be uh, recovery after burn, getting a prosthesis and that sort of thing, and they've got this terrific lab there. And uh, the fellow who runs the lab that builds the prosthesis was prosthetics was telling me, um, you know, once upon a time, everybody just wanted one that you couldn't really notice. Now the kids come in and they say, oh, for my prosthetic leg, I want, I want the American flag on it. And they, you know, maybe want, you know, the name of a pop star, that sort of thing. It's something they want to show. I can't help but think that has a lot to do with the veterans, the wounded warriors who are coming. Nobody wishes that on anyone, but once you've got it, it's almost, a, it, it, it's a marker, not a badge of pride. I, I don't want to overstate it, but it's a marker of, I did this for you. And so I, I thought it was fascinating that, that even the kids now are starting to say, oh yeah, I, I want some sort of a fancy design on my prosthetic limb and that sort of thing. You're making it easier for everyone to talk about. I'd like to touch on that if you don't mind real quickly. Uh, you're right, I do wear my prosthetic leg as a badge of honor, because I earned it. You know, I earned these scars that I wear on my arms and my legs and my face and my neck and then the unseen scars in between my ears. I earned them, I fought for them. I love blood and body parts on the battlefield. You're damn right I'm proud of them. And so, yeah, I mean, that, this is a way for us to show, even the kids, it's a way to show, them, show everyone in society I'm a victim, I'm a victor. I'm strong. They may have gotten my leg, they didn't get my mind. I can keep going. And that's one of the reasons that, yeah, I mean, we, I think our community is, has led that fight and, and been palpable on the fact that, hey, keep fighting, keep moving forward. Yeah, it's tough, but you gotta keep moving. So as we find the veterans, or you find the veterans, and in both of these uh, studies that we've done, it was kind of interesting. We were worried for a while, we at the commission were worried for a while, how are we gonna find this pipeline of veterans? How are they gonna know that this, this study is going on and the governor's directed some money be spent for therapy for them to see, to assess the validity and you know, that sort of thing. And it turns out that, uh, I mean, we were so naive, we were silly. We're gonna have to go to the military bases and advertise it or you know, some promote it. No, no thank you. They, there is no shortage of veterans because they talk to each other. You would never have shown up at the UT Dallas Center for Absolutely Brain Health, not. but for one of your it. comrades saying, hey, you know what, you go or I'm a hog tie and drag you myself. You know, whatever, that, right. whatever that discussion You're was. Absolutely right. Yeah. Um, so once we do that, are we better serving the veterans by, serve, by treating them just as veterans? You're a veteran, so you're here. Are we doing, will, will we do better if we integrate them with other folks who have the same affliction? What, at what point do we stop treating you as a wounded veteran, start treating you as a wounded person? Is, there, is this an issue? Would you, would you care as long as you're getting treatment somehow? I feel like the more that the, the veteran um, opens up and, and relates, it's like um, you know talking to his boss last night. Um, I, my oldest son, um, he has mild cerebral palsy. And by connecting, um, not that that cerebral palsy um, is a mental health issue, it, it, but it can lead into um, you know, educational, intellectual struggles as well. But by connecting, having that, oh, we're veterans, and that deterring it to a, a different type of topic and conversation, it's no different than that veteran going home and um, hey, I met some great people uh, at this conference, or I got to see a little YouTube clip on, on you know, traumatic brain injury. Um, don't single out that veteran. We, we don't want, we really don't want that recognition and honor. It, it's just that, that inner one-on-one -on -one conversation, when we start sharing, that opens that door to so many other opportunities, because I guarantee you that veteran or that wife, that spouse, is gonna go and talk to somebody else oh, I met this great person, and they're gonna establish a rapport. And then by word of mouth, you're gonna get connected, whether it's a network, a nonprofit, the VA, and bottom line, that veteran, that family member, they're getting the service that they need. They're getting that recognition. Yeah, and I'm, I'd like to say, Chloe, if I may, I think the way to do it's empower them. Let the veterans know, hey, look, I mean, how did Texas get so great? 
Well, we wanted to make the example, right? We wanted to lead the way. That's why we're in the best state in the country. Well, let the veterans do the same thing. Empower them and say, look, we need you to lead this front. We need you to keep serving. Use your, use your status as a prior service warrior to be a leader once again. And lead these different groups, whether they're children or, or diseased adults or what have you. That's how you do it. You gotta empower these warriors to, to be able to tap in to the huge, huge potential that they all hold. Well, our military veteran peer network is based on volunteering. It's not paid positions. I mean, yes, the state provides um, <coughs> around 30 paid positions, but the, the stability and, and lawn going is finding those volunteers in your community who's willing to help. Whether it's fixing a, a house, it's gathering those veterans, because as we said, Jake, you know, he's about to become a homeowner, and I'm like, connect with veterans. They'll be the first ones at your door with a hammer, willing to, you know, plumbing, whatever. But by, you know, finding your volunteers in your community, they are going to be the essential, whether it's, again, a veteran, a family member, or, you know, your local clerk at the 7-Eleven. Um, you know, they're going to have that connection. They're going to have that information. They're going to have that empowerment because once they see, once they see the, um, the, the product, the final product, whether that's the healing, the change in that person, uh, the, you know, those veterans, that spouse, that husband was about to become divorced, now they're not. You know, that, that child is getting that therapy, that play therapy to help him deal with his anger and now he's not, you know, uh, venting it at school and his grades. It, it's just, it, it spreads so quickly. Um, and the fundamental society, don't, don't separate us, empower us together. That's going to be your success. I want to leave a couple minutes for questions, but um, when, we, when we talk about the, the families, what is the follow-on like for veterans after they're discharged? Is there, is, uh, is there still that connect? Obviously, you'll leave the base and you'll go live somewhere else if you're living on base, but is there that connection with the families or any follow-on support from the military? I'm not saying there needs to be or there should be or anything, but is there a follow-on support to, to, to um, uh, deal with the families who are seeing the stresses that you saw when you were active duty? I feel so. Wives especially are, are more um, likely to contact, uh, right. whether it's a veteran, whether it's a VA resource. Uh, they're, they're usually your first connect to. And, and it's by through that wife or through that mom, typically, uh, or sister, um, you're giving them that information. Okay, here's my business card, or here's our, our link, or what are the areas that you see that that veteran is struggling with? You know, have them just in, in your casual conversation at home. Just lay that information there for them. And by connecting that family, uh, that wife typically, that mother, that sister, um, it'll eventually get to that veteran. He'll have that, that awe epiphany moment and he'll go, I'm going to look into this. And, or he may ask his buddy, have you looked into this? So I think sometimes connecting to the family is, is the bonus, mm -hmm. if you will, um, because eventually that wife or that female representative will get, get that information in their sly ways. They'll get that information to them. <laughs> so. How about that? Mr. I, I would just say, and it's been my observation listening to both our veterans that the, the, the the impact of the, the mental health on the family, you know, much more so than other health conditions, I think. And as we see it on an ongoing basis, uh, we see cancer support groups all the time, you know, and not understand and know the value of that, you know, and what the impact is on, on families. I think from a mental health point of view, the impact on the, on the families is, is substantial. And as we look at how we fund various things, I think we need to not forget that, that there's a, a, a a very big and lasting ripple effect when we're dealing with uh, in, in the whole arena of mental health in general. Veterans, uh, you know, 
present a unique population that, that I think certainly, you know, again, there's no, no cookie cutter way to, to, to help manage those kinds of things. But one of the things that we do see, you know, is, is that for, for, for everybody who has a mental health condition, veterans, uh, no exception, um, prob perhaps even more so, is that ripple effect throughout the family. And it, it doesn't just stay for a year or two years. It's, it's really something that's an ongoing thing. And as we look at the things that we're going to be doing from a funding point of view and so forth, keeping those types of things in mind in terms of making sure we get our money to the most effective places has to include a consideration of those things that work for the family dynamic. Um, I don't know if there's one quick question. One quick question. All right. Yes, sir. Perry Jeffries, I'm with the TechFed Initiative and work with Tasha a lot. And I'd just like to first point out that we talk about the 22 veterans a day that die by suicide. That does not include anyone from California or Texas. So that's over 2,300 this year already. One of the challenges in the delivering these services is that there is a shortage of mental health care professionals. Um, President Obama signed the executive order a couple of years ago told the VA to add 1,600 health care professionals across the country, a thousand of those jobs are still open on USA Jobs. Is there something Texas can do to help encourage the training and education of more mental health care professionals to make them available to both DOD and the VA? Um, I'll defer the chairman in just a second, but absolutely there is. We know that in our commission, at our state mental hospitals, we need more psychiatrists. We just, we're not training them, we're not training enough, to, uh, we, don't, we need more child psychiatrists desperately in this state, but we need more of the professionals um, to, to get trained here. If they go to medical school here and train here, and I'll expand that too when I say medical school, I'm also going for the nursing school and advanced nurse practitioners and others, so I don't want anybody to take offense. But if we train more of them here, and particularly with the docs, if they do their residency here, they are most likely going to stay here. So we've got two new medical schools opening. That's gonna, we've got most of the state's population within a short drive of, 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 of medical school, at least within a couple of years. Um, and so we, we'll, we'll need to do better, but we'll need both primary care docs who are often the front line to recognize some of these issues, but we also need those professionals who are steeped in the knowledge of psychiatry and neurology to help us with these folks. And, uh, it's all about money. Great, great question. <laughs> all about money. You're welcome. Uh, great, uh, great question. Uh, one that we did address to uh, uh, some extent last legislative session in expanding graduate medical education slots, as the commissioner is referring to. We, we train more doctors from a graduating point of view than we give them the opportunity to complete their training as residents uh, in specialties and so forth. And what we also looked at is making sure strategically these dollars to expand GME are used in a way that address the shortage areas. And psychiatry is one of those. But not, not to think that that's the end of what we have in terms of needed professionals out there. There's many uh, other professional, professionals, counselors, other uh, fields uh, that deliver health care that we need to continue to bolster, psychologists and so forth. Uh, uh, that there is a lot that can be done, what needs to be done, when we start looking at the numbers and the need out there. When, uh, I'll use this as an example, unrelated to what we're talking about here, the incidence of autism, uh, one in 68 now, that we're starting to recognize this. What we know is that there are therapies that can be utilized for, for children that are subject to autism that clearly uh, puts them in a, in, in a better place uh, down the road. Uh, but you've got to have the people trained in it, and it's fairly expensive right now. And so. Um, that's an example of the type of thing that we need to continue to do and push more professionals uh, or encourage them or incentivize them to go into these different fields. Yes, yeah, psychiatry is one of them, but, but, but there's a whole gamut of others, uh, you know, other than psychologists and others who deal with this intimately that uh, can, can be of great value, substance abuse counselors, things of that nature. Thank you again, Commissioner Janik, uh, Representative Zerwas, and uh, especially Jake and Tausha. Thank you so much and uh, for your time today. Thank you for uh, your service, what you've done for me and my family, and uh, 
and for all of us. And thank you, and I know folks are strategically sneaking in a break, even though there actually isn't a break right now, but just make sure that you're very careful sneaking back in because it's, it's, so, it, it's so subtle when people come in and out because we have the doors up here right by us. Um, I wanna just, uh, in addition to saying one more time, thanks to our last panel, just to acknowledge that in addition to the leadership that these folks have shown, we are also thrilled that, that particularly the kind of work that Jake and Tausch are doing is leadership, not just for veterans, but really for every Texan. Because what Jake was saying about struggles with emotional hardship and how he was able to find help to become the best civilian, the best dad, the best worker he could be, that's really what our mission's about for mental health more broadly, because everybody in this room is going to and has experienced hardship. And that's really a lot of what mental health treatment is about, is helping people find ways to deal with that, to come together to help treat. So we're gonna now have a, our next panel come up, which is what we call our Smart Justice Panel. So if, if folks could begin uh, coming up here and, and joining us, uh, joining me, I guess. Um, I want to talk about what we mean by smart justice. We have a, a pretty simple policy priority here that we think um, has the possibility of being really game changing if we truly commit to it. And that is the goal to treat mental health and substance abuse needs for Texans in treatment settings and instead of jails and prisons. It's a very simple goal. Um, there is tremendous data, much of it coming from Texas, showing that treatment as an alternative to incarceration is safe and not only is it safe for communities and safe for individuals it's actually more effective in terms of preventing recidivism and more effective in terms of effectively and efficiently treating problems around um, crime and around mental health needs so that's a pretty simple thing but it's a pretty hard thing it's also the kind of thing that when I would tell my grandmother when she'd ask me, what is it you do for a living, Andy? And I would explain to her that one of the things is trying to help treat people with mental health needs and treatment settings rather than jails, she would say, people pay you money to, to, to tell people things like that that are so obvious? I mean, it's, it's something that, that in many ways is an obvious truth, but it's something that's really hard. And it's not rocket science, it's things like when we've gone and looked at some of the programs, like for example in Bear County, which is doing a lot to lead on this, it's, it's getting transportation from the jail to the alternative, secure transportation. It's getting bond set and helping people meet bond if, if they're not released on their own recognizance that sometimes is a, a minimal amount of money compared to what we would spend incarcerating that individual, but that person has no money, so they're not gonna be able to make bond. It's things like that that we can figure out, but takes some mind-numbing detail to do so. So, fortunately, we have some wonderful people here on our panel to talk about success in that. Um, not only are they going to talk about some of the ways to be successful in that, but they're going to show that we really have some consensus in our state that now is the time to go stop doing pilots, stop, research, stop uh, only doing this as sort of a demonstration, but to really take these types of alternatives to scale. We are uh, honored to have chairing our panel today uh, the 27th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Texas, the Honorable Nathan Hecht. Chief Justice Hecht is the longest serving member of the court in Texas history. He was first elected to the court in 1988 as a justice. He's been reelected four times. He was appointed by, uh, to, to be Chief Justice by Governor Perry in 2013. Since 2010, he's been responsible for the court's efforts to assure that Texans living below the poverty level have access to basic civil legal services. Throughout his service on the court, he has overseen revisions to the rules of administration, practice, and procedure in Texas courts. He's been a leader on many issues, including the issues we're talking about today, and was, even, was also appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States to a Federal Advisory Committee on Civil Rights. Joining the Chief Justice this morning um, is Ms. Ann Beeson. Uh, Anne is the Executive Director of the Center for Public Policy Priorities. The center was founded in 1985 to improve health care access for impoverished uh, Texans. The center has expanded to ensure not just health care, but also good nutrition, jobs, and education, and protection for Texas children. Anne was previously the Executive Director of U.S. Programs at the Open Society Foundations, where she promoted human rights, justice, and accountability nationwide. From 1995 to 2007, she was National Associate Legal Director of the American Civil Liberties Union. We're also joined by Sheriff Chris Kirk. He is the Sheriff of Brazos County, where he's responsible for operating the county jails, investigating crimes, traffic control, maintaining communications with other law enforcement organizations in the area. He's a member of the National Sheriff's Association and graduate of the National Sheriff's Institute, and he currently chairs the Sheriff's Association of Texas Legislative Committee. 
Brazos County is a leader in Texas uh, in the area of mental health crisis intervention, in the area of uh, crisis diversion, and we're honored to have you here, Sheriff Kirk. Thanks for joining us. And we also have today, this is not Mark Levin, this is uh, Mr. Vic Reddy, who works with uh, Mr. Levin um, at the Center for Effective Justice at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Um, the center, the, the foundation was founded in 1989 with a mission to promote and defend liberty, personal responsibility, and free enterprise in Texas and the nation by educating and affecting policymakers in the Texas public policy debate with academically sound research and outreach. Um, uh, we're, uh, Mark, by the way, I just have to say, did his very best to get here. He was in New York yesterday with a, a snowstorm, flew all night to get to Houston, but they didn't get him on a plane in time to make it here today. But he fought valiantly, and if you see him, please thank him for his efforts. But we're very appreciative, Vicar, that you're able to be here today um, to, to talk about these issues, to talk about the work you've done um, at the center. And you know, I think it's really important to recognize that the center and the work Vicar and, and Mark and others have done have really helped forge what we see as a bipartisan consensus that treatment is the smart alternative to incarceration for most people with mental health and substance abuse needs. So um, Chief Justice Hecht, I'll turn things over to you, sir. Thanks very much. Um, thanks to the Institute uh, for this convocation today and this um, uh, focus on issues that are important to us. Uh, as well as to all of the people of Texas. Uh, thanks especially to uh, Tom Luce, uh, who is uh, uh, steering this, I think, uh, very much in the right direction, and we are grateful for his leadership. Uh, Tom, uh, I, I think when I counted up that I was 27th Chief Justice, I did not count Tom Luce, uh, because he was Chief Justice for one case. Uh, back in the late 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, so I may have to uh, put an asterisk there and say really I'm the 28th if you count one case um, for uh, Tom. Uh, but um, uh, you, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, judiciary this morning and the court system uh, and uh, its role in some of these uh, in some of these issues. So you've seen uh, policymakers. Uh, like Speaker Strauss and Dr. Zeros and, uh, and uh, uh, Commissioner Janik uh, and talk uh, from a point of view of funding and from a point of view of uh, policies uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are very important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit now about uh, the non-policy making but the policy carrying out uh, function of the, of the judiciary. You think of the judiciary, I think most of us, in terms of uh, deciding cases. So the case comes in and the judge sits there and he just, it's, uh, uh, you d determine uh, uh, responsibility and perhaps pass sentence in a criminal case. Um, but the judiciary uh, in Texas does more than that. We are actively involved in trying to make sure that the, uh, that the justice that we hope uh, is afforded in our courts is available uh, to everyone, uh, to all, justice for all. Uh, and that it is, uh, that it makes sense, that it is administered efficiently and that judges have all of the, uh, uh, the tools they need uh, to make uh, uh, decisions in, uh, in every case. So many of the policies that we are discussing today intersect in the courthouses. Um, and many of the decisions made in courtrooms uh, are going uh, of uh, the economy, the prison system, and our society uh, as a whole. Um, we've had some experience with this in the past uh, uh, several years, so I'll just give you a few examples uh, of ways that the Texas judiciary is trying uh, very hard uh, to be sure uh, that its courts uh, meet the justice needs uh, of the people. Some years ago, um, it came to our attention that judges in uh, child custody uh, cases uh, were not often, uh, not always provided the information that they needed to make uh, the decisions, appropriate decisions in those cases. Uh, sometimes because uh, 
different parts of the government didn't talk to each other, uh, sometimes because um, of privacy concerns, uh, sometimes just because nobody asked. Uh, and uh, it, it uh, was brought to the Supreme Court's attention uh, some years ago that we needed a convocation, we needed a place, a commission where people could come uh, that were uh, stakeholders interest, interested in these issues uh, and com communicate uh, and collaborate uh, in order to make these proceedings better. So we created the Permanent Judicial Commission uh, on Families, Children, Children and Families, uh, and Judge Specia uh, led it for uh, a number of years uh, uh, until uh, while he was a, a, a judge deciding those cases. Uh, and uh, from that en enormous experience and background, uh, he has since moved to uh, uh, lead the Department uh, on Family Protective uh, Services. Um, but that was an example where people needed to be brought together uh, just to uh, look at how these uh, courts in these cases function uh, and to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, develop and implement uh, better policies for them. It's a very quick process in the sense that people can come, uh, share information, and then th things uh, uh, get done uh, as a result. Um, also, uh, uh, j just last session, uh, our court was involved in um, looking at the uh, juvenile laws that uh, often uh, criminalize uh, schoolyard misconduct uh, and bringing together uh, people who were interested uh, in these, uh, in changes in these laws uh, to decriminalize uh, much of that uh, behavior. The, um, uh, uh, this impacts the courts directly uh, because many of our criminal judges are complaining uh, we don't want these teenagers uh, in court and I'm uh, looking at a decision that may ruin their lives uh, and uh, this needs to be treated, this, need, this case needs to be handled by the ju juvenile court down the hall uh, and not by the criminal court. Uh, and uh, so it impact, while it impacts the, uh, the courts directly, it still is a policy issue that we, uh, we needed to work with the legislature and the executive with, uh, together uh, to try to um, uh, come up with uh, uh, changes that would uh, treat these cases uh, better, and, and we did. Uh, our experience in specialized courts uh, goes back now uh, about uh, uh, 15 years or, or more, uh, and uh, when the, the idea was first presented, uh, people were not sure exactly, you know, uh, are we mollycoddling these people, or, you know, we're gonna uh, pat them on the head when they really deserve something more severe, and, you know, how does this fit in the criminal justice system is this is this is it stern enough is it strict enough or or are we um, overlooking an opportunity uh, to really take people who have done no more than made a misstep a serious misstep uh, but still a misstep uh, and not try to find ways to rehabilitate them for their sake for their family's sake uh, for the economy's sake if that if you just to put a dollar sign on it uh, for the prison's sake, uh, and come up with better solutions. Um, and I'm proud to say um, that Texas is one of the leaders in the development of these courts in the country. Um, in fact, Governor Perry just got an award a couple weeks ago as, um, for uh, Texas leadership in developing um, these specialty courts, drug courts, mental health courts, veterans courts. So, uh, we just had very, uh, st I thought, stirring presentation by the last panel uh, of the realities of veterans returning uh, from, uh, from service. Unfortunately, um, some of them uh, find themselves um, in the sheriff's uh, focus uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, while it's very serious, and has to be treated seriously. Uh, in many, many instances, uh, an overwhelming number of instances, um, the uh, treatment that is available, uh, counseling, um, 
community services that are available to, to help transition uh, these uh, servicemen and women back into the community, uh, keep, uh, allow the charges to be uh, dismissed, and result in very little uh, recidivism. So this is a, a very important and constructive um, innovation uh, for the courts from when I started 30 years ago. Um, and my uh, colleague, uh, Sharon Keller, presiding judge of the Court of Criminal Appeals, has worked uh, very hard uh, on these issues uh, as well. So. Uh, the judiciary, uh, as Speaker Strauss uh, said at the beginning, the, the Texas House uh, stands with you uh, as you uh, consider uh, ways through this, uh, particularly through the Institute, uh, to uh, better uh, address mental health issues in Texas. Well, I'll tell you as the Chief Justice that the judiciary stands with you as well. Uh, and we uh, want to be sure that the courts uh, are attuned uh, to these issues and are uh, adjusting to the ways that they're, uh, they're presented to us. We have an excellent uh, panel uh, this morning to talk about those uh, issues, both from policy viewpoints, uh, and the sheriff has a, uh, a very practical uh, uh, presentation to make uh, of how really, uh, how some of these things actually work out. Uh, and so I hope uh, that you will find uh, this illuminating and at, at when we uh, finish our presentations, we'll uh, try to uh, take questions um, uh, toward the end. So Ann, let's begin with you. Um, tell us from your perspective uh, and from your organization's uh, uh, perspective, uh, uh, what are the issues here? And, and uh, give us your thoughts. Sure. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. I want to just first begin by really, I don't think any of us can thank the Meadows Foundation enough for right. um, having the brilliance to launch this new institute. And uh, uh, I just feel very privileged to be uh, a part of it in any way and uh, a little humbled up here knowing there are so many very smart people in the room that have got real answers to the problems that we're facing. and just wanted to share a little bit um, about, about what we see. I'm feeling, frankly, like a very optimistic Texan this morning because we have the, all, the highest levels of all three branches of our government here <laughs> uh, to figure out what the solutions are um, to the challenges that people living with mental health issues face in our, in our state. Um, as you know, I'm with the Center for Public Policy Priorities, and we were actually founded by a group of Benedictine nuns who felt very strongly that poor people should have access to health care. And our commitment to that issue continues, and we have very much embraced and, and been involved in, in forging public policy solutions for, for people uh, living with mental illness as well. And uh, again, very uh, privileged to be uh, a part of this, this, this event. Um, I want to just say, you know, do the kind of classic, give you the bad news first, um, share a little bit of information. You know, what is the challenge here? What are some of the problems that we all agree um, can be fixed? And then spend uh, most of my, my, my couple of minutes sharing some real world solutions that are out there. Um, so what, what's the real challenge that we're facing in the system? Well, today in Texas, people with serious mental illness are getting the services they need primarily when they are experiencing a psychological crisis. It is a crisis-driven system. And the absence of appropriate services uh, in the right places at the community-based level is pushing people um, who are experiencing a behavioral crisis um, into emergency rooms and into jails. Uh, that's the problem. Um, this doesn't help them, and as we all know, it actually doesn't help the taxpayers either. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. In 2012, the data shows that up to 40% of the bookings in local county jails in Texas, which, you know, in Texas, percentages, I'm not so into percentages because we had a whole lot of people here. So what does that number really mean? It means 400,000 people, okay, were, um, that were booked into county jails um, had, were already involved in the mental health um, uh, service system. And what that means is that many, many of those people, those real people, could have gotten treatment at the community-based level, um, which would have prevented them from coming into the system in the first place and saved the taxpayers a lot of money. Um, now, I want to just give you a little cost comparison. Community-based mental health services have an average cost of $12 a day. $12 a day. 
while the cost of crisis-based care ranges from at least $50 a day in a county jail to over $1,000 a day for an emergency room, well, $1,000 for an emergency room visit. And we obviously, I think, can all agree that we want to be investing our resources where they have um, the most benefit and, and, and cost us the least amount of money. Well, the good news, now for the good news, um, we have real world solutions that are already working today here in Texas. Uh, and we also have great ideas that are in development that we really need to pay attention to. And I want to just mention five. There are many more, and there are many of you in the room who have many more. And so this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is the good news. This is how we're going to fix this challenge. Um, first one I want to mention, um, there is a jail in reach program in Harris County, which has led to reductions in the length of jail time uh, and lower rates for people being arrested again. Um, I had the chance just last Friday, it was such an inspiring trip, to visit um, Haven for Hope uh, and the Center for Healthcare Services in San Antonio. And I was so inspired by their work with law enforcement to divert people with mil mental illness from jails and ERs uh, and into um, community-based treatment. And I know we're going to hear from the sheriff about the great work they're doing in Brazos County as well. Um, second, um, here, right here in Travis County uh, and in other communities throughout the state, um, we have mobile crisis outreach teams who are setting up care and providing care where people are, um, both at county jail booking centers and also in emergency rooms. Um, third, third solution. It's common sense. I loved Andy's point um, before about, about his mother. This is sort of a similar point. It's common sense that people with mental health challenges should be able to continue their treatment when they are released from jail or prison. Okay? Um, what we know is that um, when you do that well, um, you're going to have many, many fewer people who are going to be rearrested and come into the system again. Now again, we have already got some good programs out there. The Texas Correctional Office has a great case management program that's working to make sure that people can continue treatment when they leave jails and prisons. And it has um, reduced the percentage of people who are being rearrested from 23%, which is about the average the Texas Department of uh, uh, Criminal Justice tells us, to about 13%. That's a program that works. We need to expand the program and make sure that it reaches others and, and build more like that. Um, now kind of towards the things in development. We have people all over the state, local providers, who are experimenting with new models for transforming the mental health care delivery system, thanks to the 1115 waiver program. The center and other organizations are studying these models um, so that we can share um, which ones are working and expand them and scale them up. Again, the point that um, Mr. Luce and uh, many others here have made uh, today. Um, finally, we know that trained peer support programs are working here in Texas. We heard about the great program that was working for military veterans on the last panel. We also know that these programs are working at the community-based level. Um, at the center, one of the projects that we are working on right now um, is to uh, research the potential to bring those peer support programs into correctional facilities as well. Uh, and we will be proposing a, a pilot project around that, around that concept. Uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave my opening remarks to, to that and just um, say again that I'm feeling optimistic as a Texan that we can actually um, really address these challenges and improve our, our mental health care system here in the state. Thanks. Uh, let's get another policy perspective. Uh, well, Patrick, Chief, uh, I'm before we go here. before we go to the sheriff here. Sure, right? but if you don't mind, I'm going to call time out for a substitution. All right. Mark Levin. Oh, good. Right. Oh my gosh, the great <laughs> Levin. Uh -huh. Uh, but uh, we're really pleased to, to be part of this effort and would also uh, just really commend the Meadows Foundation uh, for taking this challenge on. And uh, it's truly great to be able to work on these issues. You know, uh, I will tell you that uh, it's really this type of thing brings people together across the aisle. I was talking to, uh, testifying before Congress a couple months ago on solitary confinement, which is a major issue with regard to mental health. Um, and uh, 
you know, I started, Senator Durbin started out the hearing, you chairs that committee by saying you're going to get us both in trouble by agreeing so much with me. <laughs> and then uh, I said, well, I've known and admired Ranking Member Cruz for many years. And then Cruz broke in and said, well, now you found an area where Durbin and you disagree. Mm -hmm. And they got a good <laughs> kick out of that. But, you know, the truth of the matter is we all want more public safety. We want to control costs. We want better outcomes for offenders and their families. So, uh, frankly, we've been making a lot of progress in Texas. We've had a double-digit drop in our incarceration rate and crime rate. We have our lowest crime rate 1960, since 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, our county jail populations have fallen as well, uh, but there's still counties that have major challenges on overcrowding, and one of those is Harris County, which of course has the largest mental health facility in the state in terms of their jail. And statewide, we have eight times more mentally ill people in jail than in civil uh, commitment facilities. So uh, the corrections area is where, uh, as has been said before, the backstop for, for the rest of the society on the issue of the mentally ill. So uh, there's a lot that can be done. And just to give you another uh, point of reference, 27% of those in prison and on parole have a mental health issue, 12% of those on probation. Uh, that's on the adult side. The juvenile numbers are even higher, particularly mm -hmm. now that the, uh, we've had a two-thirds drop in the number of youths in our state youth lockups. A uh, greater share, about 40%, have a severe mental health issue. So uh, it, this is a major challenge for us. And let me just highlight some of the suggestions. And there's going to be an interim hearing on April 22nd, uh, House Criminal uh, Jurisprudence Committee, where uh, these issues will be addressed. Um, one of those is assessment, if you want to start at the beginning of the process. And we have a state law in the Code of Criminal Procedure that within 72 hours, the sheriff is supposed to notify the judge of mental health issues. Um, unfortunately, a survey of 244 Texas judges found the vast majority do not find out about a mental health issue until either arraignment or trial. And a lot of cases are disposed of by time served, people that don't get out on bond. Uh, and people with mental illness may not be well equipped to contact a bondsman, may not have resources. So those people are serving a lot of time before a judge even learns of their mental illness. And um, in fact, the average uh, cost of a mentally ill person who's admitted into the Harris County Jail is 7,500 versus 2,500 for non-mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that is they cost more per day, but a lot of it is their length of stay is significantly longer. So uh, we need to actually make sure that those assessments get to the judge or magistrate when setting bond. Uh, we also, uh, frankly, need to look at having this uh, included in the pretrial sensing report that probation puts together. Um, another issue that I think is very important is uh, looking at the pilot program for Harris County that was in the budget last session that we worked with Senator Huffman on and getting some good evaluation of that during this interim and then maybe uh, looking at how we could replicate it in other jurisdictions uh, during the next session. Uh, one of the uh, areas that also is a major concern is the number of inmates who are discharged without any supervision. And uh, this is, uh, of course, the case with nearly all state jail inmates and then with a number of prison inmates as well who serve out their entire sentence behind bars. Now, this has particularly acute consequences for the mentally ill. Uh, Tacomi, which is the state correctional agency for offenders, used to set up MHMR appointments with those who came out of state jail who were mentally ill. And these are thousands of people every year. Now, only 18% kept their appointments. They weren't on parole. No one knew who they, where they were. There, no one was, there was no leverage to ensure that they show up and comply with treatment. So they stopped scheduling those appointments a few years ago. So we literally have these people being discharged with almost no medication, and no one knows where they are. So there, were, there was legislation last session by Steve Toth and James White, which didn't quite make it, but would have required split sentencing in many state jail cases, uh, which means these individuals would be discharged onto probation. Uh, where, of course, they could receive treatment uh, and also be monitored. So we hope that this will happen. The state jail recidivism rate is uh, over 60 percent, where it's only 30 percent in the prison system. So, and again, the state jail offenders, for those who aren't familiar, it's less than a gram of drugs, repeat prostitution, hot checks, and so forth, all nonviolent effects. Offenses, excuse me. So uh, one of the other areas that I referenced earlier is solitary confinement. The numbers are going the right direction. We still have about 8,000 people in solitary confinement in Texas. A significant percentage are mentally ill. The research has shown they tend to decompensate uh, once they're in solitary confinement. It's 23 hours a day with no exposure uh, to stimulation except for an hour. And uh, one of the real concerns is that we're discharging directly from solitary confinement about 1,000 people uh, every year to general society. And half of those are parolees, half have served out all of their sentence behind bars. And a lot of those who are being paroled are because they only have maybe uh, three, six months left on their sentence, and the parole board wants to have them come out on supervision. Uh, but we need to 
bring an end to that practice. And we also need to look at reducing solitary confinement, period, uh, and making sure there's review process for those who may be mentally ill, who go in uh, because they're unable to understand orders from prison personnel and look at other interventions that could be more effective. Um, now, one of the other uh, issues, and I'll wind down here in just a minute, is uh, specialized probation and parole caseloads. Now, these are, uh, in the adult system, typically you might have 110 people for every probation officer. With a specialized caseload, you have about 25. And these are for mentally ill uh, probationers and parolees. Uh, and uh, the results have been quite impressive. Uh, literally half the recidivism rate, half the revocation rate for those on the specialized caseloads. And this is where you have the officer, of course, special uh, trained uh, uh, with uh, how to work with mentally ill offenders, how to work with MHMR, and actually having the time to follow up to make sure the treatment is, is going well. And so, uh, unfortunately, there's only about 3,000 folks on these specialized caseloads, but the need is far greater. And so, uh, the, m the numbers we're looking at, and we're hoping to update those, would show that if we expanded the specialized caseloads, we would actually save more than the cost would be, because we'd have fewer revocations to prison, not to mention fewer victims of crime, which is really central to, to what we're trying to accomplish. So let me just uh, wrap up by touching on two other issues. One is the mentally ill youths who have been moved from Corsicana in Texas Juvenile Justice Department to MART now. And I would really uh, ask that we look at uh, moving more towards a Missouri model, uh, where you have group homes in Houston, Dallas, other areas where not only these kids' families are, but where there's a much better access to uh, sophisticated mental health treatment personnel. We have the largest medical center in the world in Houston. Uh, many child psychiatrists who, uh, for example, could see uh, a youth or two, but also have a practice, a regular practice, and be, really be much more efficient. Um, and then finally, on the school discipline issue, uh, we have uh, excessive rates of suspension uh, for students who are special education as well as mental health issues. Uh, we need better training for teachers. We've heard of cases where a kid has Tourette's, uh, but the teacher doesn't realize that, so they treat it as a disciplinary issue. The kid is suspended. 23% uh, of the out-of-school suspensions in Texas are special education students. Uh, they're only 11% of the student population. So simply kicking kids to the curb is not going to solve our problems over the long haul. So uh, I'll leave it at that, and, and thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Um, if you were n noticing, uh, Ann was shaking her head up and down. Oh, wow. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, and uh, uh, these are uh, groups that come from very different perspectives, and yet on these issues, uh, we find that we have much, uh, uh, much common ground. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheriff, tell us about your work in Brazos County. Well, first, howdy from Aggie Land. <laughs> uh, we're not all that mad at the orange anymore. <laughs> don't really, you just don't care anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to care. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to echo what's already been said about uh, the Meadows Foundation and the efforts here. I, I participated in the community forum uh, there in College Station with uh, Tom Luce and his team. And, didn't think it would land me like this, but uh, here I am. But, uh, you know, I think it's really exciting that they can put together a room like this full of people that have, are caring and wanting to go to work on this issue. So, uh, I'm here to talk about a, a program that, that, you know, on the practical side that we put into effect in uh, 2006 in Brazos County. At that time, we had an overcrowded jail. I mean, we, we were sending inmates to other jails at a extreme expense to the county. And uh, we were looking for answers, and we went out and started looking at best practices, and we found several uh, and implemented a couple. But the idea of crisis intervention and intervening on the street and keeping people out of the jail uh, really hit home for us. And so we started a team in late 2006 and since that time, we've diverted 1,000 people from, from our jail. And so, you know, it really is a successful program. Uh, we're one of many that are doing this in the state, and we actually went to Williamson County. It's where we saw this best practice in, in uh, use, and uh, they were very benevolent. They let us ride along. They helped us. They came over and trained us. And we started this program uh, with the idea that we were going to empty some jail beds, and, and we certainly have. But it, it's a neat program in that it collaborates with the community and MHMR, the hospitals, all of law enforcement are working together on that. And so when, when we have someone that gets into crisis, 
we send a team member out there. And we have four deputies uh, that work nothing but crisis intervention. And if Bryan PD or College Station PD or Texas a and PD is called to a scene what they believe is a mental crisis, then we send an officer out there and, and they work to resolve that. And so our officers are, as you can well imagine, well trained and they, they know how to pr provide an assessment. And, and if, if necessary, they use a, a PEOC to uh, uh, detain the individual and take them to our local uh, MHMR for an assessment or to the hospital, wherever we could find that. And so, you know, the idea then of being able to decide if diversion is possible is, is really important, uh, not only to leaving us jail space, but to the person, because it gives them the proper compassionate care that, that they need and the treatment that they need. I can tell you in 2013, our CIT four deputies uh, made 1,543 calls. 30% uh, of those originated from the hospital, so we're working with the ER, uh, and then law enforcement uh, agencies, uh, and then MHMR, about 30% all of those three, and then 10% of, of a variety of other ways. But, so we have collaborations at every level there, and we, we can then uh, work towards that diversion. In last year, we diverted 184 from jail, and when you look at the impact that has on counties, uh, we, we find in an average, uh, uh, someone with mental health stays in our jail for about 35 days. And that cost is uh, about $61 a day. And so right off the top, then you got $390,000 a year mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the county would expend if those folks ended up in jail. Another side note, just on, on that, we have an average daily population this year, about 580 in our jail. Uh, $140,000 is spent on psychotropic drugs. Uh, that's about 35% of our budget. So it's really, really important that, uh, you know, if we can divert them uh, and keep them in the community, it's, it can reduce our costs, uh, certainly, and be better for the inmate. Um, <coughs> The fact that we have 1,088 beds and 580, you know, we have room in our jail, but uh, we've continued this program even though now we have bed space because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing for us to care for those people in our community and not in our jail. I call our uh, empty beds happy beds and uh, <laughs> I really, really love those happy beds. So. <laughs> but, you know, on the other side of that, you know, if we have a diversion, then our deputies are involved with transport, and we did 793 out-of-county civil transports last year to Austin, Houston, uh, Waco, even as far away as El Paso to find an available bed. Uh, so uh, we did 1,427 in-county transports, which amounted to about 4,300 hours of man hours of driving and uh, 115,000 miles. So we're, we're putting <coughs> the officer and the consumer at risk by hitting the roads. And so that's another thing that a community-based crisis intervention program can uh, alleviate. Now, when we find the cycle of decompensation uh, uh, in mental health, I mean, we, we, we've face this. I mean, I'm one of 254 sheriffs. All of us talk about the fact that we have to respond to crises out in the community. We end up with crises in our jail. Uh, and it just seems to be that it's a revolving door. You know, uh, we get them medicated, we get them stabilized, and we rely on their families or the patient themselves to self-medicate. And somewhere along the line, uh, that uh, falls through the and uh, so we see them start to decompensate. And so uh, part of the CA CIT program that we have is the community-based program is our deputies, crisis deputies, are assigned a caseload. And they actually visit M MHMR uh, to find out who's missed an appointment or whose uh, prescription's about to run out. Or, you know, in some cases, uh, our deputies know these folks well enough to say, well, I need to go check on so-and-so today 
to see how they're doing. And it's that kind of intervention uh, that's very successful in our program. And we're finding that that support is, is really beneficial. Just this, this week, Monday, we had an uh, incident where uh, a 22-year-old uh, threatened his grandparents, uh, wanted some money, and uh, got very agitated and uh, didn't assault anybody, but he made some threats to them and then left and they called the sheriff's office in the meantime and he was aware that we were coming so he went to his house next door got a gun and he shot the gun three times and then told them that if the police showed up he would take his own life okay well he barricaded himself so we surrounded as you can imagine we had a SWAT team and helicopters and we were ready to intervene and one of our crisis deputies said well you know I had some interaction with this person and we were able to get him on the phone with, uh, through his father's phone, and uh, the deputy talked him out and surrendered peacefully. Mm -hmm. And he's uh, getting the treatment that he needs. So, I mean, it really pays back. They could use you in Nevada, Sheriff. What's that? <laughs> they could use you in Nevada. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, they could, they could certainly develop this program. Yeah. As well as we did. <laughs> you know, one of the, the limiting factors that we have in our program is, is access to crisis beds, and it, it's not something that we suffer from. It's the whole state. And so, uh, you know, we need to find those resources. We need to find a way to, to get people into a bed. Uh, crisis intervention has been a great program for us. Uh, it's appropriate compassionate care that they need uh, it reduces the risks to the community uh, it's reduced the risk uh, of the jail and the impact of the jail most importantly it improves the continuity of care for these people and uh, not only the the patient or the consumer as we call them but the families mm -hmm. and, and I think that when I've uh, looked back on this program as it's developed um, when I started it, all I was interested in it doing was clearing the jail. Now, it's such a popular program and the families embrace it that it's, it's really incredible to know what difference we're making. Um, it promotes collaboration between law enforcement, our hospitals, our MHMR, and the other providers that we use. So uh, it's a great program and it needs to be replicated across the state. I'd say, just in summary, that we have some challenges. Uh, the dual diagnosis uh, aspect of the patients with dual diagnosis uh, creates a challenge. Uh, the public and private resources, the access to those things are certainly uh, uh, difficult. We have Care Match that has all those to, that are involved in VSHS programs, but we don't have a list of people that have diagnoses for private. And uh, so that goes uh, as a challenge. Our rural <laughs> Texas uh, is challenged because they don't have access to resources, and so we have to find a way to do that. Um, HIPAA and civil rights uh, and rights to privacy are all been brought up in discussions, and, and there has to be a way to accommodate all that, but at the same time find the help for these folks. Uh, so I'll, I'll just close by saying that practically, Crisis intervention, community-based, is a good program. It works in Brazos County. It works in other communities mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. And uh, we ought to be making an, a model for all of Texas. Uh, it sounds... <laughs> it sounds, uh, in some instances, the diversion decision is made after a crime has been committed, or arguably yeah. The well, you know, off of obviously, if there's been a crime committed, there has to be uh, some, uh, you know, resolution to that. Yeah. Uh, but if there's not a serious crime done, some decisions can and some discretion can be made at the street and uh, find the help that is needed. If you have a major crime, uh, assaults or, uh, some, you know, any type of crime, uh, you know, you may have to use the criminal justice system. Right, but the the examples the, the, the example you gave uh, uh, of the fellow that fired the handgun, a decision was made not to uh, right. he, bring charges. He made no threat to any officer, right. and the, the threat to his parents uh, and grandparents 
uh, was not with the gun, and uh, they chose not to file a case. So, yeah, he's where he needs to be. Uh, and you mentioned that you've discussed this with uh, other sheriffs in the in the state. Uh, is there any uh, opposition to the program? No, actually, uh, the Sheriffs Association of Texas uh, the number one legislative platform issue is mental health. That's true. Um, so yeah. <laughs> So what impediments are there to um, making these policies that we've talked about uh, realities everywhere in Texas? And well, Mark, <laughs> money, is it, uh, or what? Well, I don't know that we need more total spending, but we could reallocate some of the money that we're using to lock people up at the back end, you know. Uh, so, for example, one of the ideas that we've offered is with mental health courts, if a county is willing to uh, you know, uh, make an arrangement with the state whereby they would send fewer, uh, could be limited to nonviolent, uh, mentally ill offenders to the state, then the state would give them money for mental health court, for example, and other strategies that we've been talking about. Um, so, uh, you know, that's one of the things. Um, you know, prosecutors have also been quite supportive, uh, you know, on this particular uh, mental health issue. Um, and so uh, I think the, you know, the key is, uh, one of the issues, the barriers that I think we're hoping to fix next session is there's a law that says you have to bring someone before a magistrate within 24 hours, and we have some legislation that was filed in 2007 by Representative Escobar that we want to try again that would basically give police, at least in misdemeanor cases, an exception where they could bring someone directly to a crisis care center. And, and some of this is being done already, but, but this would avoid that trip to the magistrate and I think give law enforcement additional discretion mm -hmm. that's valuable. Um, I think it's a great question that you asked, and I, I really think that the first answer ought to be there are no impediments, and so let's do it. You know, uh, and now, yeah, of course, there are some public policy changes that we need, as as Mark pointed out, pointed out, and I pointed out, and but but mainly it's it's an issue of kind of public will and, and the will of the leaders of of, of the relevant um, uh, agencies, really, to to scale up these programs. Um, you know, they they have the authority to do that. You know, um, and we ought to be pushing them collectively to do so. And and implementing as few of the, you know, as many, I'm sorry, as many of, of these solutions as we all agree on um, as, as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, and, mm -hmm. but I mean, do we need a statute? Do we need a change in the law? Do we, mm -hmm. uh, what, do, do we need a proclamation from the governor's office? I mean, <laughs> well, well, what, uh, what, what, what is standing between us and getting this more? Well, I think your proclamation, because you know, Chief Justice Jefferson talked about last session in his state of the state, this uh, citations to school, uh, kids, that 10 year olds getting tickets, you know, for chewing gum and other minor misbehavior. And so, but partly thanks to him, the uh, significant reform of that was passed last session. So, right. you know. Well, and, and just to be clear, again, decisions need to be made by policymakers, right? And, right. The, you know, the decision, both Mark and I mentioned, you know, this good case management program, that, but it's only reaching a certain number of people to reduce, you know, recidivism. Well, we need to expand that program to make sure that it's reaching more people. I mean, there are things like that that need to be done. Um, uh, but I think that, again, with the public will and a lot of agreement on all sides, we could get them done. Yeah. And now we have the Institute here. Absolutely. Uh, and um, what's, what are the best things that it could do to uh, advance mm. the ball on these issues? Well, research, outreach, communications. I mean, that's um, uh, getting the information and the evidence out there. And, and I think also putting a human face like you just did on this issue is very powerful. We sometimes get absorbed in our statistics. Um, you know, another issue that we didn't mention is the uh, intersection with traumatic brain injury. 60% uh, of uh, prison inmates have some sort of traumatic uh, brain injury. Now, they're not obviously all uh, severe, but often from sometimes being abused as children, for example, uh, and things like that. And uh, I think we're doing this now in the juvenile system, an assessment for that, and we need to do that in the adult system as well, uh, because you could otherwise be off on the wrong trail where you have somebody who may have a mental health issue, but you may be thinking that they're having an adverse reaction to medication or something associated with the mental illness when in fact they also have a traumatic uh, brain issue. So it all starts with getting the assessment right, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the research point's a very, very good one. And the fact of it is, you know, uh, you know w w 
we've started where we should start, which is what are the low hanging fruit ideas that we have? What are the programs that we have that can be scaled up or implemented? You know, there are many other um, fixes um, that we need to look at. Um, and you know, there are a number of groups, Mark's group, my group, many other groups in the room who are conducting research and are looking at other programs to see, to evaluate them, more evaluation, and then you know, to, to make very specific public policy recommendations about scaling them up. And so we need to do much more of that and much more of bringing together high level leaders like this group today to, 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 to come together and say, we all agree this is gonna be done, let's do our part and get it done. Yeah. We said we'd, uh, do we have time for any questions? Your time is up. All right. <laughs> People need a break. Thanks very much. Well, Chief Justice Hack, thank you so much, uh, and Sheriff Kirk, um, Mark, for your heroic efforts to arrive, Vikrant for being stand in, Mr. Luce. Thank you. I wanted to uh, correct one. A uh, grievous uh, oversight, and that is, I want to introduce Robert Meadows, who is also here. He's chairman of the Meadows Foundation. We introduced the Rouses earlier, so Robert, thanks for getting this baby launched. We now have a break of ten minutes. Uh, as you know, traffic is stacks up because there's not many entrances here, so please be prompt so we can start the children's panel on time, but there'll be refreshments outside. Thank you. <laughs>